Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Brayhead Arena here in Glasgow, Scotland. This is the prelims for Cage Warriors 171, the hottest ticket in town. And as you can see, the fans outside the arena already queuing to get in for our first preliminary bout here tonight. My name's Brad Warden. I'll be calling the action alongside Angela Hill and Dan Strauss. Dan, great to have you here. First time in Scotland for Cage Warriors and a huge fight card. Absolutely. I mean, it's great to be here. I'm a huge fan of Scotland. It's a place very close to my heart. So bringing a card to Scotland, I think uh, first time for me, first time for a really long time for Cage Warriors. I think this room is going to be absolutely electric tonight. And Angela, Scotland, kind of close to your heart as well. Yeah, this is a full circle moment for me. Me and my husband, uh, we met overseas, but he's from Scotland. He's from Edinburgh. He went to Glasgow School of Art. So I know the city pretty well. It's been fun just walking around, seeing all the Scottish people, and I'm going to see him get real crazy tonight. It is going to get crazy, and this is exactly why a huge fight card we've got coming up for you. Let's take a look at what's going down on the prelims. we got Jan K. Hagens. He's back in action against Konstantinos Delis. Paul McBain returns after a two-year absence to face Albert Diaz. Jack Eglin is taking on Dan Dice. Jordan Strong in lightweight action against Jordan Little. Jamie McDonald and Nell Ariana will throw it down in a big light heavyweight bout, but that is not all, folks. Plenty more action on deck. Scotland's Michael Blair takes on Deck Dean. Igor Voitas takes on Ronald Searhunt. Ian Postlethwaite makes his Cage Warriors debut against Pab Sahota. Musha Zlani back in action against former MMA Fight Academy participant Kadeem Dia. But we kick things off with the featherweights. It's Scotland's own Thomas Hepburn. It's Cornelius Aritonang. And here's our man in the cage, Mr. Hal Chaplin, to get the night's action underway. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live from the Brayhead Arena in Glasgow, Scotland, coming to you on UFC Fight Pass for the preliminary bouts of Cage Warriors 171. Please welcome your first fighter, making the walk to the cage in the blue corner, Cornelius Arger Aritona. It's time to kick things off here at Cage Warriors 1 at 71. Cornelius Aratone making his walk to the Cage Warriors cage for the third time now, becoming something of a fixture here with us, part of the MMA Fight Academy. You can see Coach Jake, Coach Chris Carley, and of course head coach Mark Fiore. The man who's got a couple of UFC titles to his name. A long career in coaching, coach some of the biggest names of the sport, and now lending his knowledge to the students of the MMA Fight Academy. These guys, of course, out in San Diego, California, training full time. And we've really seen how they've come on leaps and bounds over the past couple of years. Aritona made his Cage Warriors debut back at Cage Warriors 1 at 54 in May of last year. That was over in Italy, and we saw him most recently in Newcastle in this uh, November, rather, of last year against Matthew Moya. Second round TKO finish for the Indonesians. So he's seen a, a fair bit of the world since joining the Fight Academy. I know him and his, uh, his fellow Indonesian, Ronald Sihon, on the card later on tonight. They've struggled to adjust to the temperatures here in Glasgow, but. It's been a glorious week, all told. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome making the walk to the cage in the red corner, Thomas Hepburn! We were discussing this in the office earlier this week, guys, but I think it's the first time we've ever heard someone come out to Robbie Williams. I mean, it's certainly an interesting choice, isn't it? But I'm here for it. Oh, yeah, certainly, uh, certainly no shame in the, uh, the song choice for Thomas Hepburn. Getting the crowd going here, early doors at the Brayhead Arena. 
making his Cage Warriors debut tonight, 33 years of age. One on one so far as a professional, but had an extensive amateur career. Went six and two before making the leap to the pro ranks in, in 2018, but didn't compete again until 2022, and that was the last time we saw action. So things have been a bit sporadic for him over the past couple of years, but we're looking to get a big win here tonight in front of the home crowd. Get some of that momentum, get some of that consistency going. The first Scott on the card as well. And the crowd filing in early here. This Cage Warriors featherweight contest is brought to you by the good people at Attacks. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, he serves by the age tour. Our official weight, 144.8 pounds. He's fighting out of North Sumatra, Indonesia, and brings into the cage a professional record consisting of three wins. Introducing Cornelius Arjun. Out of the right corner, he serves 62 inch tall. Official weight 143.4 pounds. He is fighting out of Edinburgh in Scotland. And brings into the cage a professional record of one win with one defeat. And Trotsky's in Sayo. Summers! Your referee in charge of the action begins, Mr. Paul Crosley. Veteran referee Mr. Paul Crosley about to get this one underway. Three five minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors featherweight division. You ready, Red? Cornelius ready Aratonang in the black. Thomas Hepburn in the orange. <coughs> you immediately see the difference in heights here. Hepburn 6'2, Aratonang just 5'8. Super lanky Hepburn is. Oh. Trying to get that knee up the inside. Good take down oh. defense from Maratoning there. Off the back of the head, keep himself clean, pick his shot. He looks like he's got a Off wrist, he's trying to roll through shot, to force Maratoning onto his back. Those are hard shots on the side and the back of the head. He's, he's going for a standing straight armbar. I mean, he's rocking these Sakuraba shorts. <laughs> this is sort of a Sakuraba-esque technique. I mean, Sakuraba known for attacking the uh, Kimura when people were grabbing onto the bat like that. So, I mean, he really went for that straight armbar. I've, I've not actually seen something quite like that. And uh, there's enough to, to force a reaction and able to get on top momentarily. Yeah, I think... Cornelius was just a little too aggressive there, but now he's on his back. Oh, he needs to yeah, 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 yeah. the yeah. There it is, folks. Okay. Just over a minute on the clock, and Cornelius Aratonang gets his fourth pro victory. Rapid start to the action here in Glasgow. What a crazy, crazy scramble there from the first engagement. I mean, Lazy Shaw uh, gets punished for it, grabs onto this really weird straight arm bar as he has his back taken, almost seems to, to get a little bit of momentum. Here, we're going to look at it there. I mean, that was <laughs> that was about as on as you could. I mean, it's very difficult to tap someone in that position where they can move their body so much. Aritonang uh, goes for the back there, is unable to get it. Hepburn gets the top position, but then the back take, the speed of the back take uh, that we'll see in a second, hopefully, that led to that. And the arm is already around the neck, straight away, sunk in there. I mean, a beautiful, beautiful finish. There's the tap. We're going to take one more look now at this finish. Big squeeze from Aratonang. Yeah, one of the significant factors here, of course, you can see the, the right arm of uh, Hepburn was trapped by the legs there, making defense. I mean, defense for, of, of the rear naked choke is much easier in MMA than it is in, in pure grappling because of the gloves. But when you trap someone's arm, it's basically impossible to defend. So easy to attack from there. Big finish for Cornelius Aratonang. Here's Mr. Howell Chaplin to make it official.
Ladies and gentlemen, your referee, Mr. Paul Crossley, calls a stop to this contest after one minute and five seconds of the very first round, declaring your winner by way of River Maker Chuck in the blue corner, Cornelius RJ Arizona. Big win for RJ here in Glasgow. Making that trip and braving the cold temperatures worth it for the MMA Fight Academy man. We're going to take another look at this finish, swift as it was. Damn, really no escaping it at that point. Yeah, I mean, he already had the arm sort of around the neck as he went to take the back. And we're going to take a look at the MMA Fight Academy corner there. Very happy with their charges work. I mean, a lot of these guys came into the MMA Academy with very little grappling, very little wrestling. And to see your fighter perform that way, have really tight uh, defense, really sharp reactions, and then take advantage of that opportunity to get to the back like that, they have to be proud. Phenomenal stuff. Well, there's more MMA fight catching action coming up later on. But right now, it's time for the welterweights. It's Mush Aslani versus Kadeem Dia, and it's coming up right now. Ladies and gentlemen, making the walk to the cage in the blue corner, please welcome Mush, the Beast Aslani! Aslani making that walk for the third time as a professional here on Cage Warriors. We actually first saw him back at Cage Warriors 78 as an amateur. That was way back in September of 2016. A victorious rear naked choke in the second round against Luke Begley that night. Turned pro and joined us again at Cage Warriors 147 unplugged. Took on hot prospect Adam Darby and stopped him with a TKO in just 20 seconds. Real quick work from Aslani that time. Next time out, of course, ran in to Omran Shaban, a fantastic up and coming fighter in his own right. Aslani dropped that one. First round, Anaconda choke. Looking to get back on the winning track here tonight at the expense of Hadim Dia. since we last saw him. Looking fresh. Currently fighting out of Team Re Renegade in Birmingham, England, originally from Iran, and has that wrestling pedigree. Making the walk to the cage in the red corner, Hadim Dia! As a professional, is Kadeem Dia. We're going to support in the crowd for Kadeem. First time fighting here in Scotland, so people clearly traveling to come and see this young man. Third time we've seen him on Cage Warriors, made his debut against the very tough Milton Alfonso Cabral back at Cage Warriors 154. Last time out, took on Bartolomeu Esposto in Rome, got a first round TKO, just over 90 seconds on that occasion. He's a big, strong guy, 6'4", Aslani 5'11", by contrast, so 
really is going to be about whether Russia Zani can get a grip of his India, get those arms around the waist and get him tripped to the mat. Take away that height and reach advantage, but Dia himself, no strangers to a bit of wrestling, but a ground and pound. Ladies and gentlemen, this Cage Warriors Welterweight Contest is brought to you by Fairtex. Interesting first, fighting out of the blue corner. He turns 5 feet 11 inches tall. Official weight, 170 points, one pound. He is fighting out of Birmingham in England and brings into the cage a professional record consisting of four wins with four defeats. Introducing Bush, the Beast Aslani. Standing opposite him in the cage, fighting out of the red corner. He stands 64 inch tall. Official weight, 170 points, three pounds. He's fighting out of Milan in Italy and brings into the cage a perfect professional record of four wins. Introducing Paddy Diaz. Your referee in charge of the action begins, Mr. Rich Mitchell. One of the best in the business today, Mr. Rich Mitchell, about to get this one underway. Three five-minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors welterweight division. Mursh the Beast Aslani in the black, Kadeem Dia in the white. Okay, you ready? Ready? Let's go. Important fight for both these guys. Aslani four and four as a pro, so looking to get some positive momentum back on his side. Kick by Mush. Be patient, waiting for, waiting to really let go. Now they're really throwing in the pocket. Yeah, Mush really like a, a tightly coiled spring. He really does put a lot into these shots, but has to be careful. Oh, the counter. Big step back cross, landed, and now he's down. Gandia working his way to pass that guard, but he doesn't really have to. He can just stay here and hammer fist, hit, elbow. This is a nice sweep attempt here from Aslani underneath. He's got that into butterfly guard now. I mean, it looks like he's going to try and go for a double underhook sweep. And what he needs to do here is he gets, needs to get a bit of extension. If he goes onto his back and he kicks the legs away and changes that gripping position from under the armpit to a sort of around the tricep. Ooh. And he inverts underneath and goes for a heel hook here and he's applying it. He doesn't have much far side control, but we're not seeing a huge amount of reaction from his opponent in terms of, terms of moving. This is, and, and, and he releases there. Obviously, he doesn't feel like it was on, but. And now it's Dia who's going to try. They, these guys are going to trade leg locks here for a little bit. I don't see that very often. Bit of mid 90s pancreas action there. <laughs> yeah, it bit. seems like a lot. Just need some palm strikes, right? Stand up and punch, but each their own. And as Lani uses it as an opportunity to pick up the ankle on the way out, and now he's in this back clinch. He is going to want to fight this grip. Yeah, Dan needs to get that underhook on his right side. Keep using the cage to, to use it as a kind of anchor point, build himself back up. But if he gets that underhook, he can start breaking the grips. Sometimes it feels a little hard when they're super tight like that, but if you push on the hands, push on the gloves, then you can really work away. I'll grab that. And uh, that's not an incredible show of strength as he carries him through the center of the cage to the other Mush side. Said, Stop giving him ideas. I'm taking him over here. <laughs> yeah, you see that big power from Aslani. And he's taking his man right into his own corner. And you can see, look at the uh, left hook of uh, Aslani. He doesn't just have it on the inside to try and utilize it as a back control. He's got far side control as well. So very often people will use that from a back clinch position to try and sit backwards and take someone's back off of it. And, and possibly Dia actually sits to his back there to avoid that happening, tries to turn into face his opponent. 
Two minutes left to play within this first round. Is Lonnie really looking for back exposure here? You can see him grip fine on the far side. And I think he's going to be quite happy to accept top position here. I mean, lots of opportunity for a straight past the mound, but instead staying very, very tight in this half guard position. And from here, I'd really love to see some, some ground and pound from this position. I mean, the round is still relative, in terms of damage, is still relatively close. Yeah, Zani looks a little stuck right here. That pressure on the top, shoulder pressure that he was using earlier. Keeping him on the ground, keeping his shoulder blades flat on the ground. He needs to really bridge and use that arm that he has around the head to just push him to the side and try to get some space. Use your position here. Let's go and work. And there we see the, the warning from referee Rich Mitchell. He's not going to let them just hang out in this position. He wants Aslani to do a little bit more. I mean, Aslani has worked very hard to get to this position, so he, he really needs to keep the pace on here to not lose it. Because this is a great position for him, but he's got, you know, he's got just over a minute on the, uh, on the clock for this round now and really start to open up with some of these strikes. Yeah, even a couple of little hammer fists or elbows, anything that doesn't really give up the pressure, but just allows him to score. That would keep him in this position. And in a round where there's been little damage from Kadeem Dia himself, it only needs to be a few short shots there to put points on the board for Aslani. And actually, a nice little bit of grappling there from Dia as he, as he reached from half guard to a far side Kimura control, trying to use that to stand. Now, Aslani's just a little bit too tight to him, a little bit too dominant in these grappling exchanges to allow that to really transpire into anything. But yeah, nice control from Aslani, but hasn't been able to convert this to much damage so far. Dia keeping himself a grounded opponent there. Doesn't want to take the knee from Aslani up against the cage. And, I mean, the round had no That was totally within his right question. That was perfectly fine. He shouldn't have stopped there with what, three or four seconds to go. Rich Mitchell just giving Moshe Aslani a bit of a warning there. Do not stop until I tell you to stop. Yeah. And you know, protect yourselves at all times is the instruction, right? I've never seen that before. I would have teed off, especially after a round like that where I'm stuck on my back the whole time. I mean, that, that'd be a highlight. Basically, <laughs> just stands up, looks you in the eyes with his hands down and gets knocked out. <laughs> We're going to see the knockdown here. It was a beautiful counter from Aslani. He does leave himself open a little bit when he wades in with the big shots. Yeah, I thought it was the right, but it was a hook that landed first that got him on top. Here, I wish he had just tried to stay heavy a little bit in the way that Aslani was later in the round. He let him get that leg lock attack and gave up space, and then Aslani was able to get on top, take him over to his corner where he could, like, just really lay on him and do go to work. So the question will now become, for, for the judges at least, was that knockdown enough to take the round in, in and of itself? Tell you to stop, okay? Not your fault. Ready? Ready? Let's go. And then we had the warning again from Rich Mitchell. Keep fighting until I tell you to stop. Oh. A straight right hand from Aslani there. The cat kicks are working for Aslani too. If this stays on the feet, he should really keep using that. It's a big swing from Aslani, teasing the takedown. You see him looking down towards the feet of Kadeem Dia, trying to get a reaction. Dia needs to keep him long, keep all of his punches long right now, because every time he gets a little too close, he allows Aslani to get those calf kicks off. He's a really lanky guy, so yeah, the more he can throw that straight right, that big hug over the top, try to check him as he comes in, the more he's going to be able to tee off at a distance. It's perfect counter to the leg kick as well, but Aslani catches him. Shoeing up that lead leg. Yeah, he's really doing a lot of damage. I don't know if Vizlani can tell, but he's getting a huge reaction off that cap kick. Whenever you see someone with little toothpick legs like that, it's going to get a reaction. Turning into a bit of a dogfight here in the second round. Yeah, D is doing a great job every time Aslani gets into the pocket. He's able to land hooks, uppercuts, anything on the inside. Get that big reaction, pop his head up. Oh, big name. Yeah, as 
Well, he's trying to, to feed the takedown in order to throw big shots, but he's got to be careful because he's not really buying on it, and he's starting to, to really uh, take advantage. He's starting to really land with these uh, punches. Beautiful. Oh. Beautiful trip there. Really nice. It's always the danger with Aslani. If you can get in close, he can put you on your back with ease. And he passes here, and now it's going to be Dia who, uh, who, who transitions into a hill hook here, and he's, he's trying to apply it. The position isn't great. And the question here is, who's going to be able to take advantage of the, uh, of the space that these two guys are creating in, in doing these attacks? Who's going to take top position here? We know that Dia's going to want to get back to his feet. And as Lani's going to try and take top position and pretty much continue with what he was doing for the second half of the last round. As Lani trying to get a bite on the heel of Kadim Dia now. In an almost symmetrical position here, I mean, it's almost something a little bit artistic about that, like a butterfly or something. Yeah. Both these guys go for an outside heel hook on the same leg. I was going to say a nice little yin yang side. Yeah. Or an M. If there's a sponsor with the with the with the, with the M. Then uh... McDonald's is right outside the arena. <laughs> oh, we don't, we don't endorse that. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Other fast food outlets are available. <laughs> still, uh, still on this hill hook here. I mean, you can see how, how much he's struggling to actually get a bite. A cheeky little wink from Aslani over there. As long Letting as the judges the know he doesn't have anything. Oh. I'd really love to see, uh, well, as Lani try and take top position again. You know, he had so much success uh, in, in the last round in controlling once he got on top. Well, in the first round, Dia made the mistake of dropping to his butt after getting his leg free, where it would have been a lot easier to just try to get back on top or land some ground and pound from this position. Nice hammer fist from Kadeem Dia trying to do some damage now. Put Price on the board. They look like they're, uh, they're working here. There you go. Much better decision this round. Stay on top. He probably got yelled at by his corner in between rounds. Now he can just hang heavy, land some elbows, and still this round. I mean, to be fair, I think he's been shouted at by his corner during the round. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't want Coach Lorenzo to be shouting at me, so... Hopefully, Kadeem Dia can uh, keep going to the boss man's instructions here in the last minute of the second round. Dia trying to pass now. Got the right foot on the inside. Got the laces on the inside of the leg. Might try and create some space and bring that, that leg out there. There, but what's your head there, Kadim? As Lani now starting to, to, to regain some semblance of a guard. He's still, he's still in sort of half guard position, though. I'm not sure why he's trying to grab onto the body from there. Stay busy. If, 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 if I'm Lani underneath, I'm trying to get back into a full guard position. I'm going to push on the on my left hand side, push my opponent's leg back in, and, and, and try and get back to a guard. He had some success in the first round playing from this position, even if, if it was into a leg entanglement. But right now, it's looking uh, like Diaz really taking control of this fight. End of the round, and that is a big, big round for Kadim Dia. Some great striking on the feet early on. It was Aslani that got the takedown initially. Well, it, well it's quite funny actually. It's, it's almost a, a, a reverse of what happened in the first round, which is uh, in the first round, Aslani was, was put on his back. He used a heel hook to get to top position and then dominated, dominated from top position. Second round, a lot more successful striking from Dia early on. And uh, it's Aslani who gets on top, Dia goes for the heel hook, and then controls that top position for the remainder of the round. It's like when you pick the same character in Street Fighter, you know, <laughs> just... Take turns. You mirror it, yeah. It's a unique double outside heel hook position here. Neither of these were very close to, to really doing anything. And, I mean, heel hooks are not super high percentage in MMA, I would... You know, the smart move really is when you see the opportunity to try and take top position, and we've seen both of these guys do it successfully in round one and two. Still anyone's game. As we head into the third and final round, Kadim Dia, Mushezlani, five minutes to win it. Mushezlani trying to wade in the game. Oy. Dia does a great job of staying on the outside here. Oh, 
Let's see what he does with this front headlock. Yeah, nicely uh, spooled there. It does look like Aslani's starting to, to fade a little bit in terms of his energy. You know, it, it, this is not the same guy who picked up his opponent and carried him across the cage a couple of rounds ago. And you see every time on the feet, Aslani throws a shot, he's loading up, he's putting everything into it. And that's going to deplete the gas tank. Same, same buffalo goal we saw in the first round. I'm we're going to see uh, Aslani try and get underneath for a leg and take top position again. I mean, it's, it's a really effective way of creating opportunities from the butterfly guard. He transitions now into the full guard position. And with what he needs to do at this point, I'm not sure that this is a great idea. He's trying to cut the angle a little bit for an arm bar, but very much telegraphed there. I mean, right here, just putting the feet on the hips and pushing away is always a good idea, too, because when you're stuck in guard, you're just going to get pummeled. The attacks are really obvious a lot of times, unless you're real slick on the ground. And unless Dia puts one of those legs forward, you can't really get that heel hook attack to get the sweep like he did before. You've got to stay busy here. Stay busy. But he fears corner, happy with that ground and pound, but he'll need to keep it up. Otherwise, he's in danger of losing that position. This is much better. Another strong showing in this third round from the Italian. Big elbow by Dia. Yeah, Dia's do, do doing a really good job with his ground and pound. It's what we wanted to see from Aslani in the first round when he got top position, but we weren't seeing much of it. Dia has taken every opportunity to do damage, either on the feet or on the ground, and certainly playing the smart, more active, more aggressive game. Yeah, when you're long like that, you don't really have to pass the land to ground and pound. I think uh, Aslani was trying to get to a good position, but he used a lot of energy passing his guard just to uh, be, careful of your be stood up at the end of the round. I don't speak much Italian, but I understand what Bravo means. I'm kind of happy with Kenin Dia's work here in this third. Yeah, as long as he's still looking for opportunity to attack the arms off of the back here, but he's been relatively one-dimensional in, in, in his attacks right now. He's just looking to isolate an arm. He's he's not really opening up any other attacks. Now we're back inside of a powerful guard. And now I actually think he has a lot more opportunity. We saw a brief moment of a cradle. He's going to go back onto the legs here, but Diaz's base and body weight is just a little bit too small, and he's got a little bit too much energy. There will almost certainly have to be a finish for Mush Aslani at this point. Time to start throwing those Hail Marys. We're seeing more, more attempts for Aslani to get underneath there, and he, he wants to get Diaz way over the top of him so he can grab onto a leg and, and use it either to wrestle up or to threaten to get to top position. But Diaz knows exactly what the game plan is now, and he's just keeping his weight far enough backwards that Aslani is unable to get underneath. Cradle position now for Diaz. Great passing position if he wants it. Just over a minute left in the round and the fight as Aslani tries to find a way out from underneath Kadim Dia. Again, ends up with Dia in the close guard. Yeah, every time he gets to a position where he can hustle and get to the fence or try to get out of that guard and get back to his feet, he just kind of lays back down on his back. Dia pushes him down and he accepts it. It's, you can tell there's a lot of exhaustion right now. Yeah, and, and this is very, very stay good. Busy, stay busy, stay busy if you want to keep He's this really position. Stay busy. I mean, every movement that Aslani tries to make in order to get a little advantage, Deer is immediately shrugging it off. He's punishing him the entire time. He's making it dirt. He's making it nasty. He's got the forearm in the face. He's just a, being a bit overwhelming right now. And, I mean, just doing a great job of controlling the, uh, you know, the last couple of rounds, but certainly this third and final round. We approach the closing 10 seconds. Kadeem Dia will take the points victory here in Glasgow. Another impressive showing against a very tough and dangerous opponent. And Mush and there's a final buzzer. Yeah, great job by Dia and... Uh, it was a surprising sort of turn of events after the first round. The first round, he really was out grappled, out 
wrestled and he came out of the second round. He didn't just win the next two rounds, in our opinion, anyway, but he actually won a lot of the grappling exchanges. By the third round, he was just far, far more dominant, far more active, and, and landed a lot more damage. Yeah, looking forward to seeing how the judges scored that first round as well. Beer, of course, getting that big knockdown, but then Aslani with periods of ground and pound, but nothing really too damaging. Could be a 30-27 sweep here. Yeah, I think it might be. It did a great job of staying on the outside and landing those straight punches, those one twos, three twos. And just using his length to really pick Azani apart from the outside. Then when he would get down, he'd be able to stay on top, land some ground to pound. But whenever the sweep happened, Azani didn't really score on top. So I agree, you guys. I feel like this could be a 30-27 sweep. Well, the scorecards are in, so it's time to find out. Here's Mr. Howell Chaplin with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of mixed martial arts action, we go to our judges' scorecards. All three judges score this contest 29 28. In favor of your winner, by way of unanimous decision, in the right corner, Andy Diaz! As expected, a big win for Gadeen Diaz. Moves to 5 0 oh now as a professional. And that's another solid performance against a solid opponent. Just 24 years of age as well, Kadeem Diaz, so really does have his entire career ahead of him. Wow, so young, he's a baby. I couldn't tell with all those tattoos. But uh, you can see him working on every aspect of his game. He looks like a striker, but then he'll get a good takedown. He'll go for hill hooks. It's a lot of future for that guy. Well, we're going to keep the action running here in Glasgow. And we move to the bantamweight division. It's Pavsa Holter, it's Ian Postlesweight, and it's coming up right now. Ladies and gentlemen, making the walk to the cage in the blue corner, please welcome Pavsa Holter! Second walk to the Cage Warriors Cage as a professional. Had a long amateur career before entering the side ranks, went nine and six for some very good opposition over the years. Called a good few of those fights myself. Had his Cage Warriors debut as a pro back in March of 2023, but just over a year ago. And unfortunately, never really got started on that occasion. Stopped by uh, Sam Kelly, a quick stoppage in just 11 seconds that time, so we didn't really get to see what perhaps Ozo is about. It's a long, rangy striker, very technical, good power. Got back on track in December of last year, defeated James Williams by unanimous decision, and now returns to us here on Cage Warriors, looking for that elusive first win in the famous Yellow Gloves. Tells us to expect a little bit of uh, Kung Fu tonight, so keep an eye open for that one, sports fans. Ladies and gentlemen, making a walk to the cage in the red corner, please welcome Aaron Postlethwaite! Scott fighting someone from 
Huddersfield, England, but you add in the Bangor walkout tune and safe to say a, a partisan Brayhead Arena behind Ian Postlethwaite here tonight. Ian the Ferry Postlethwaite, what a nickname. Very talented young man, bit of a messy record, six and six as a pro. But it's testament to the level of opposition he's faced. Got a beautiful heel hook victory over Cage Warriors veteran Christian Tebbert, April of last year. He's actually won three on the bounce now, which is a career best for him as a professional. So you just get the sense that that momentum really is on his side. And he's looking to make a run at the Cage Warriors bantamweight division. Gentlemen, this Cage Warriors Bantamweight contest is brought to you by Fairtex. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands 5 foot 11 inches tall. Official weight, 135 pounds even. He is fighting out of Huddersfield in England and brings into the cage a professional record consisting of five wins with two defeats. Introducing Pav Sahosa. Standing up to him in the cage, fighting out of the red corner, he serves 5 to 4 inches tall. Official weight, 134.3 pounds, he is fighting out of Kilmarnock in Scotland. And we get to the cage, a professional record, 6 wins and 6 defeats. And crunch is in Daniel Moverheady. One of the best in the game, Dad. Mr. Dan Moverheady. About to get this one underway. Three five minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors Bantamweight division. Good clean five Perhaps gentlemen. Ready? in the Ready? dark brown. Ready? Ian Postlethwaite in the blue and white. Rocking the Scottish flag. Third fight of the night, and the third pretty big height disparity between competitors. Sahota 5'11, Postlethwaite just 5'4. Yeah, Postlethwaite using it to his advantage a little bit, though. It's nothing more disheartening than someone ducking under your head kick. That's another thing, when you have the shortness, you're able to kind of sneak through. That was an interesting we'll move in there. We'll yeah, it's tough to see who's maybe a bit of a slip there, or...? I think he clipped him a bit and he stepped funny on his foot. Sometimes that happens when you just lose a half second. I mean, Sahota's very, very fast, but... But Ian with these massive uh, overhand lefts, looking for a home. And that's what I was saying, when you have like the shortness on somebody, you're able to kind of peek up and reach and surprise them with that overhand over and over again. The fighter kind of disappears from your vision and then they pop up with a punch. Now he's going hard for that takedown right now. If he puts his knee in the middle, he can kind of pull him over it. Get to the takedown. Or go for that trip like he's trying to do. Now he's on the single, but Sahoda is wise to it, pulling him up, digging. Yeah, Sahoda doing a great job of uh, grip fighting here, trying to take him inside position on that with his left hand and stop that full body lock here. In a deeper position now, and beautifully done the control top position. He's got to be careful about turning away and giving up the back. Well, this is where Postlethwaite is dangerous. He is a grappler by trade, four of six professional victories by way of submission, and 
all of his last three actually rear naked choke in the third round i mean guillotine in the second the heel hook in the second so this guy can put it on you i mean this is a great position he's still got half a round to go these guys are going to be relatively dry and uh, he's locked off a full body triangle here, and with short legs like that, you know that's going to be a tight position to try and move from. Are out the gloves, please, Pat. This is a long time that uh, Sahota is going to have to defend against this rear naked choke. Yeah, he looks like a little clamp back there. Like your fingers out the gloves, Pat. Kind of like a little meatball version of my husband, actually. <laughs> But you know that triangle, that body triangle is tight. Calls from his corner to strike from here, not focus entirely on the grappling, which is a massive advantage. A lot of the time, people get to the bat position and they suddenly just go into pure grappling mode. But mixing up with the strikes, giving the opponent something to think about, gives you the opportunity to slide that arm underneath the neck. Yeah, it's easy to gas out the arms when they know exactly what you're trying to do, reach around your neck. Even just like putting the putting the hand under your armpit and holding like that can really gas out the person's arms who's trying to choke. He's doing a good job using his legs. Now he moved it, but he had that leg behind his thigh, really locking himself in that position and making it hard for us to hold him to move. I mean, the problem with uh, when you do have short legs and you're locking off a body triangle is it can be quite energy intensive in those legs just to hold the position. I mean, it's going to be uncomfortable for the person who has it locked off on. But I mean, uh, the, the, the legs of uh, Ian are possibly going to be gassing just trying to hold this position. I'm surprised the ref is telling him to keep working from here. Um, He's working as hard as he can. <laughs> yeah, it, it's fingers are out the gloves, Pat. Make sure the fingers are out the gloves. An S grip here, trying to trying to get something in the neck. But Zahota is doing a, a really, you know, exactly the job that he needs to be doing. We might see a switch to an armbar here as he as he takes this uh, underhook. But keep an eye on the feet to see if he unlocks and goes to a normal back attack. Then it could be a signal that he's going to switch into an armbar. Yeah, it might be smart too. He only has 22 seconds left, so the worst that can happen is it doesn't work, yeah. and then he starts back on his feet. Fingers are out the gloves, Pat. Yeah, Sahota's done a, a great job of surviving a really dangerous position for a whole two and a half minutes. First round in the books, and it's a big one for Ian Possum to play And uh, just another warning from Dan Mavahedi there, is telling Ian Possum to that he's not going to let him just hang out on the back, as good as the position that may be. Fighters have to be looking to either attack submissions, do damage, or advance the position. As we take a look back at some of the action now, great dip under there from Fossil Thwaite. That's a good sign that they studied the tape, they looked for his tells. And here you can see he clipped him a bit with that left, with that, uh, left overhand that was landing all night. He was able to get a little wobble, might have even hurt to hold his leg a little bit. And then when he got to the offense, he was able to get that pull body lock and then lift right away. It was beautifully done. Got his hips underneath to hold his hips and got to work on top, got to the back. It was a little clamp back there for about half of the round. Straight down to business in the second round. Looking for that big swinging left was Postle Thwaite. Has to block a kick, though. Yeah, if I'm so hold on, I'm spamming that right kick. I'm trying to slow down that left overhand because it's coming out with speed and power, and he doesn't really know what angle it's coming at. Oh, nice uppercut. Good reads now from Sohoda. Tried to step in with the elbow there. Possum tried the knee. Goes to the mat, but Sohota wants him up. I mean, the speed of Sohota is, is super impressive. And... Oh, he's landing. Looks hurt. Looks a little hurt here. Oh, he's gone down here and he's got a high guard position. He's transitioning into an armbar. This is a really good position to attack the on ball from. He's barely done. He's barely done. The question is, can he get extension? He's 
going low on the wrist to try and get his best, the best leverage that he can. He's going to try and push his hips through now as Zahota tries to, 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 tries to pressure. I mean, Zahota's doing everything right here, which is keep the knees in the opponent's face and then try and pull the elbow out. Oh, this is so tense up, but he's... And he pulls out here and he's trying to transition to the other side and... You know, he does a great you job of clearing the language. language. <laughs> and he said something on the way out there that got a smile on the face of uh, Foster White. Yeah, we knew Sohota was going to let his man back up there. Hands slung low around his waist. Just touch him, Ian. Just touch him. I think possibly was a little hurt there before he pulled guard for that. Armbar. Now he looks a little bit slower on the feet as well, so it might have been good for him to like, shake the cops on his out, but... Yeah, he's looking much slower now, and Zahota isn't looking any slower at all. If anything, he's looking faster, he's looking more dangerous. Nice knee to the body from Zahota. Separates, and he's got Boss of White trapped up against the cage now. Uh, Zavoda has to be careful if ever him and get some distance and just tee off there. You don't want to grab a clamp. You want to stay away from him, push him away, make him come to you. Ooh, nice. So also really finding home to the right hands. Also Thwaites still throwing that big overhand lift, but just not throwing it with much speed or power at all. Oh, big knee in the center. <laughs> Those elbows and knees hurt. Barely fighting against that, that tie clinch. Oh, now that tie clinch of his arms running some knees back. So also working the body. Another elbow goes through. Postlethwaite not getting the better of this exchange. Postlethwaite is blocking the elbows of his neck. <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty thick neck, to be fair. <laughs> it's impressive, but I, I, I want him to do a little bit more. Yeah, I can't could be badly dazed here as well. It's really hard to see how damaged the Hotter is and how much is just defensive work. But he dropped from that knee. I mean, the sound of it was sickening here at cage side. So Hotter keeping himself grounded. Also, he doesn't need another knee on the way up. Has a minute to go to do what Shaking it against the Hotter. Nice little war cry out there. Let everyone know he's fine. And back onto the back again. If I'm, uh, if I'm bottled, so I'm not bothering with the back. I want to keep striking from here. There's Let's only 20 the arm seconds again. left. The arm is undefended here. The second hand is far away. I mean, the angle doesn't look like right, but he's going to run through. The arm is fully extended here. Sahota again by the skin of his teeth survives. But he's skits. still very much in this. Put your heads. <laughs> we thought that Sahota would start to walk away with it a little bit. It was all one way traffic and then out of nowhere drops him with the knee. Dude, where did that come from? I think my guard was down as well as Sahota's when that knee came up. Well, here it is, folks. Sahota working the body. Oh! Let's take another look at that, folks. Great angle here, right to the cheek, and Sahota dropping incredible toughness to not only not go out from that, but able to survive the round. I mean, speaking of toughness, watch this. Fossil Thwait gets the, uh, the roll. He tries to put the hips through the arm, and Zahota, with those long arms, is just able to turn the elbow to take the pressure off and escape the position. And I was scared for my angle. It looked like it got hyperextended, but he just turned it and got out. Man, what a round. I mean, what a fight.
mind having to do work on Sahota between rounds. But he looks fresh. Oh, big knee from Sahota that time. Sahota coming out swinging, and we've got to be guessing here that he needs a, a finish. Very likely that he's two rounds down, and he looks like he's going for that finish. He was doing a great job till he got caught. But you'd have to say that was the most impactful moment of the fight. <laughs> you definitely have to say that. Yes. A couple of good submission attempts from Postlethwaite in the second as well. Everything to do for Sahota then. I mean, this is not where Sahota wants to be. We've seen him have so much success in the striking. On his back now with someone as strong as and compact as Postlethwaite. Yeah, I'm impressed how he was able to get to that single leg, even with all the fatigue in him right now. You can tell he's definitely hurting from the other round, but he was just charging up for that knee, and now he charged up for the takedown, and he could probably stay here for the rest of the match if he needed to. Yeah, dominant control through the upper body. So Hota tries to wrestle up. He's got to watch the back take here. Does Puzzle, does Puzzle Sweat have the energy to continue another attack here? He does. Oh, Almost falls the off the top the gloves, pass. Get them fingers out of the gloves. It's close. So Hota trying to shrug him off. A beautiful, beautiful work. He was almost out of there. And he was. It was so millimeters in there. Yeah, he was able to get that hook in and pull him back into his guard. And the, 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 that normal back position there, not the same tightness and control that the uh, body triangle we saw in the first round has, and it allows Sahota to turn back around and take top position here. I mean, we've seen how dangerous the threats can come from Postlethwaite. Sahota wants none of it back to the feet. And that is the wise move from Sahota. That was a significant strike from the ref right there. I think Postlethwaite is really feeling it right now. Dan Mulvaney, of course, the pro MMA fighter himself back in the day. <laughs> oh. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy that uh, Portal Thwaites still hitting these takedowns. They're coming in really slow at this point. I mean, you can tell he's really fatigued, but he's, he's still managing to make him work. Big, deep breath through the mouth from Sohota as he drags himself up to try and stab back to the feet. Only two minutes to work and a pass straight into the mount position here. And this is a great position the lads have big strikes from. And you hear Ian Pothelswaite's corner saying, slow down. There's no need to take unnecessary risks here. The man who's going to take the risks is Pav Sohota. And this is such an energy draining position for the guy on bottom. You have absolutely no space right here. And Puzzle Thwait, if he just holds, he doesn't have to posture up, he doesn't have to hit. He can just hold there and still the rest of the round. I mean, this is this is the best position for, for, for damage that we've seen in this fight. And 90 seconds left in this fight. Great opportunities for big damage, but really probably focusing on control here because he is almost certainly winning this fight. He doesn't want to lose this position. He doesn't want to risk it. Get your toes out of the cage, Pav. Let's go. You've got to work here, gentlemen, if you want to keep Pav's that position. Pav's brother, Kiru Sohota in the corner. And Sohota can try to inch, inch, inch so he can turn and get a good angle on that cage. Use that to push and get a tiny bit of space, start working. Get his elbows down and get here, out. Please, gentlemen, if you want to keep that position. Very high mount from Postle Fight and me maybe Perfect. looking for the arm bar. I mean, it's kind of a crazy move for him to, to, to go for an arm bar at this point in the fight. With the energy that he has, I mean, he'd be way better off just striking some big elbows or, or punches from this position. He's got to do something. Uh, referee, lots of warnings to stay active. And that must be a new thing, because usually when a fighter gets this, to a position like that, so back mount or mount, that's enough, you know? But Got to keep the action going here at Cage Warriors. Yeah, great. I love it. Looking for the big finish here. Is he in Puzzle's weight? Ten seconds on the clock. Striking away, landing elbows still. 
So Alter trying to find a way out. He's not going to have the time here. And it's all good. Good one. Big fight. Look at him in the top of weight. A pass to Hosha and a big win for the Scotsman on home soil. I mean, that was a fantastic performance. There were so many times throughout that fight in every single round where it looked like Fossil Thread was really in a lot of trouble. You know, the speed of Sahota, the accuracy, the number of strikes that he was landed. Uh, uh, you know, I was really nervous for Fossil Thread on many occasions, but he managed to grit his teeth, especially in that third round. He seemed to have a, a second win come out and dominate again. Um, you know, after, after that first half of the second round was looking dodgy, then he lands that huge knee and turns the tide. Yeah, it was really crazy how that he just changed the whole difference of the fight. He did a great job in the first round, hanging on the back, but something landed in the second. I think it was a head kick, but uh, Zahoda was just able to tee off on him a lot better in the second round, and it looked like it was over for a second, and then that big knee just turned the tide of the whole fight. Yeah, and if, if you looked at the energy of Fossilthwaite in the second round, it, 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 it's remarkable that he was able to continue to dominate into the third. He really was looking like he used a lot of the energy in those big overhand lifts in the first round, in that grappling, on that attack on the back in the first round. He looked tired in the second round, but he came out for the third round and just dominated throughout. Well, not expecting too many surprises on the scorecards here, but nonetheless, let's go to our man in the cage, Mr. Harold Chaplin, with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of mixed martial arts action, we go to our judges' scorecards. All three judges score this part 30 27. If any of you are by way of unanimous decision, in the right corner, Ian Possible! Big win for Ian Possible, his seventh as a professional. And that's really fired up the crowd who are still. Pouring into the Brea Arena. Passa Hota still in search of an elusive first cage Warriors victory. But it's a successful debut for the Scotsman, Ian Fossilthwaite. Well, we're going to keep the action moving here in Glasgow. It's the flyweights up next. It's Ronald Siahar and Igor Wojtas. Ladies and gentlemen, your next fighter making the walk to the cage in the blue corner. Please welcome Ronald Nagasaki! on his walk to the cage. He's 26 years of age, from Candice, Indonesia, of course, fighting out of San Diego, California, as part of the MMA Fight Academy currently. This will be the second time we've seen him in action on the Cage Warriors, who was successful on his promotional debut in December of last year against Andrew Johnson Cabrera. Points win at the San Juan Casino Resort. Those Cage Warriors returning to San Diego in early June. Looking forward to another big night of action in California. Just hoping I don't lose as much money in the casino as I did last time. It's not a good night for me. It's a good night for Ronald C on the back of Cage Warriors at 165. Prior to that, he competed on the road to UFC tournament and fortunately lost against Ray Sayura. 
by Kimura in the second round. Looking to put that behind him and keep up his momentum in the famous yellow gloves. Ladies and gentlemen, making the walk to the cage in the red corner, please welcome Igor Kuchiha! is proudly presented to you by Fairtex. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands five feet seven inches tall. Official weight, 125 points, seven pounds. He's fighting in San Diego, California, by way of Candice, Indonesia. And brings into the cage a professional record of eight wins and one defeat. Introducing to you, Rona. Out of the right corner, he stands by the five inches tall. Official weight, 124 points, 8 pounds, he's fighting on a belt in Scotland. By the way, oh, Jacques Van Bowen, and brings him to the cage. A professional record, 10 wins, 9 defeats. Adrian Chisitayo, Igor Gushiha, points out. The old referee in charge when the action begins, Mr. Paul Crossley. Mr. Paul Crossley about to get this one underway. Three five-minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors flyweight division. One on Siaha in the blue. Igor Moitas in the red and black. Fast and furious start here. It's a lot of kinetic energy coming from Igor right now. You can tell there's a lot of power in those punches just looking at his trunk. Yeah, it's like he's almost vibrating with energy, isn't it? Three KO wins on the record of the Polish one. And I was doing a real good job of keeping the space good between them, not letting him get in too tight, keeping that nice longness so he can look for his counters when Igor comes in. Kick to the body there from Siam. Oh. Nice cross to the body too. Bring that to the head as well. 
Because oh. Always a good idea when you get hit in the body hard to oh, return the favor just safe. so they're not more energetic than you are. Stiff left hand from the south to the right. Reuters counters with a straight right of his own. Yeah, we'll just have to be careful of putting himself on the cage right there. It makes himself a little bit predictable when he's going to charge forward or go for a takedown. Now he's keeping the center, which is a lot better for him on the attack. Pushing Renal up against the fence. Ooh. Big punch to the top of the head by Renal. Big reaction from the crowd, from that shot, from the home fighter. Yeah, Igor's landing some power on the inside. That cross for both of them is landing pretty good, but Igor's really getting through the guard. Oh. Mixing it up beautifully there is Guccio. Yeah, I was wondering when I was going to see the takedown. He finally got a good beat on his legs. Came in with that leg kick and then grabbed for the double leg. Yeah, great timing on that takedown. Finds himself inside of, uh, inside of the half guard position. The majority of CLL's wins coming by way of strikes. So this is not where he wants to be. This is where we saw the vulnerabilities in his game against Samaria and that road to the UFC tournament. We're just really trying to free that knee. He really wants the mount position. Yeah, and tries to, to reverse and almost like he almost looked like he wasn't going to be able to and manages to get back to his feet. He's fighting this takedown attempt now, trying to get the hands in for a guillotine, even striking on his way down. Oh man, that was a big mistake by Renal to give up on that uh, front headlock and sprawl. As soon as he left it up, he gave him enough space rate. to get the double leg. Like, they literally pushed from one side of the cage to the other with that takedown attempt. Renal was almost out, but he decided to hit him, which I, I respect. I make that mistake too sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it just goes to show why having a, a training environment like the MMA Fight Academy has been so important for these guys because, you know, fighting on the Indonesian circuit back home, he hadn't fought anyone who could wrestle him, who, who could take him down, and he's, he's blasting all these guys out of there. Now, you know, training with guys like Teddy Stringer, who's going to put you on your back very quickly and learning how to deal with these situations. Yeah, it's a big advantage for him coming up against competition like uh, like Igor. He really knows what he's doing on the ground. Oh! Nice finish of the round from Igor there. And we will see a second. <laughs> and you've got to be thinking, though, there's a very obvious game plan here now. Come back out in the second round, put him back onto his back. This is going to be the takedown here. Look at the timing of this. Hope we can see it. Staying busy with the hands there with Siahan, and now we're going to see that takedown through the strike. Made a beautiful entry. You can see here as I just tried to get to the mount position, almost into reversal, gets back to the feet. But immediately. The pole is back onto the legs and driving forward, driving forward, front headlock position here. And I think he goes the frame and yeah, the strike was maybe a mistake, but I don't, personally, I don't think there's anything that he could have done to avoid that takedown. Yeah, it looked like he was just trying to get one off as he was going to take it down. <laughs> I'm going to get taken down, I'm going to punch you at least one. Right? As well. Oh, here we go again. And really, this is what I expected, but he's into a, into a guillotine here. Go 
can't see whether it's uh, oh man no it's an arm out guillotine here and you can see Ojas is fighting that Igor looks connecting really hand. Calm. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's really doing much no, right now. I don't think it's on here, and you can hear shouts in the corner get my elbow, but Boyce has only been submitted once in 19 professional fights. I mean, you look at his physique, and you can see why that is. And immediately trying the pass here. You can see the right elbow on the inside of the legs. He's trying to create space. He, he wants to get to a mount position. You can see a lot of people, they get the top position in MMA. They want to hold it. They want to control time. <laughs> Bo just wants to strike. He wants to hit you, and he wants to be in the best position to hit you from. So I think we're going to see him trying to advance. There you go, straight in the half. A lot of people would stay in half guard. I think that Bo just wants to get to mount position. He wants to really learn some big, heavy punches. There you go, you can see that right leg trying to come on the inside to create some space in the legs. He's got loads of time to work on top. Mixing up the strikes nicely, you can see the hand. He definitely wants this mount position, you can tell from the second it hit the ground. There you go, into mount. We're seeing the same reversal as last time. And successfully escapes there. I mean, wow. this is definitely going to be something the Rodas is going to have to think about if he gets the top position again. Stop trying to go to mount. There's a nice body shot there from Siahan as well. Oh. Once again, he tries to strike. I'm going down, I'm going to hit you once. I'm going to hit you once. There's definitely going to be a whole class of MMA Academy next week about not punching when the person's on your leg. Yeah, Bo just needs to, I, 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 hopefully he's got that, he's learned his lesson now, this is two times where he's been in a very dominant top control position and as he's gone to pass into mount, his opponent has tried to reverse him and done so successfully. The first time he was able to, 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 to complete another takedown, that second time lost it entirely. So, yeah, I mean, this is the right play now. Possibly past the half guard, but I would stay in half guard as, as, as the most advanced position and just look to strike from there. Trying to get those hips out. This year, huh? well, big punches about to come down right now. Or not. Oh. There we go, into half guard, he passes into side control here, which, I mean, I mean, this is an interesting position to be in because there's only one reason why you would really look to go the side control, unless he's going to try and attack a far side Gamora or something like that, is to try and transition into mount, and I just don't feel like a mount is a, it's not gone well for him so far. I would like to put himself back into half guard and just use it as a position to control the hips with the lower body and strike. Yeah, he's, try, he's trying to attack a, a north south choke there there he goes back in the half guard and i think this is a better position for him you know just under two minutes strike from him one thing you can count on those those explosions they're going to get more and more hard to do the longer this fight goes on so if he does pass them out there's a good chance that he'd be able to stuff that big big explosion and turn as opposed to getting rolled over and rolled off he's going, he's going for another north south choke here I mean, the, the problem with this choke is that he actually needs to pull backwards and the fence is behind him. I mean, Igor is really good on the ground, though. It looks like he's getting at least a, a reaction from him now. He's going to have to do something to make sure that that choke doesn't work. Arm on the inside here. I mean, look, Bodas is an incredibly strong, stocky athlete, but the, the position in there just isn't quite right. He has to sink that shoulder back down, and there's the reversal again. Sia now, you would think, wants to step back, but he's going to engage with the ground. I think that... And uh, a shake of the head from Mark Fury in the corner there. I think that that, uh, that north-south choke attempt was a, a really bad move. I think he wasted a lot of energy, because you can see the position wasn't right, but there was a reaction from the opponent to think that there was something going on, which could only mean one thing. He was squeezing that for the finish. Yeah. And I feel like that might have taken a lot of energy out. I feel like Igor did enough to win this round, though, unless something huge happens in the next 15 seconds. But it is unfortunate that he used all that energy and now ended up on bottom. That's going to give Renau a lot of uh, motivation going into the third, where he might be down two. Yeah. Third! This is the buzzer. Renau Sion ending the round on top, but a big, big round for his opponent, Igor Boitas. And 
And Angela, what's the advice going to be from the MMA Fight Academy corner now for Ronald going into this third round? Uh, the advice is going to be to stay long, stay at a distance. If you're going to throw something, throw it up the middle, uppercuts, those stab kicks, throw it to the face, anything up the middle that's going to stand Igor up because every time he drops down for the legs, he's able to get on a leg, latch on, and get him to the ground eventually. Um, and then, obviously, when you reverse the takedown, when you get up off of your back, don't jump back into his guard. Let him get up where you have that advantage in that length. Yeah, the, the subtle shake of the head there from Mark Fiore. He wants Siahan on the feet. And you can tell Siahan wants to win it there. He's been working hard on his ground at MMA Academy. He wants to win the fight on the ground as well as on the feet. I think you're right, Angela. I think uh, there's a, a very, very good chance that Siahan is two rounds down. He needs a finish here. and This, this fight could come down to whether uh, Wojas is able to get this fight back to the floor. Those takedowns are looking a little harder each time he goes for it. The left eye of Eagles looks to be closing up a little. Picks another shot on the way in, looking for that takedown. Good sprawl by Siahan. Can he clear the leg, though? Yeah, he's got a pure aggression here, just shot the shot. The shots are particularly well set up. They're quite choreographed, uh, uh, telegraphed, sorry. But, I mean, just the pure grit and aggression he's able to get this fight back on the ground. That's that Polish power right there. There you go. He double tapped and then triple tapped and finally got the takedown. Spamming takedowns until they work. When I was listening well, his corner told him to open the guard, he is, he's trying to give himself some options here, but now it's back closed. Pass in the half here. Paul Crossley's not going to let Igor hang out in this top position. You, you have to advance, you have to attack submissions, or you have to do damage. Otherwise, it's considered a neutral position. Ronald's going to be looking for that underhook again, trying to get that big explosion, that big reversal. Now, here's the question. Is Ronald going to give up potentially a position to, you know, we've seen the success he's had in the reversals. I'm wondering whether if he finds himself in half guard, could he possibly give up the mount to hit that reversal yet again? I mean, it's been working for him. It, there's no reason not to, especially if... Uh, I mean, throwing the legs up for a triangle here. Uh, and it's just the right hand of Bojas that was able to uh, shrug that off and now pass in the side. We've seen attempts of this uh, north-south choke. If he's going to go for a submission from side control, I'd rather see him try and tie up that far side arm in a Kimura. Sirhan's putting the arm in a, in, a, in a position where that is possible. A far more, uh, almost certainly the highest percentage submission, really, from, from side control. Either far side Kimura or head and arm. Boitas just keeping those strikes coming in to keep that position. As Siahan tries to find a way out from underneath his man. Looks like he's trying, well, well, it looked like he was trying for the head and arm for a second, too. He's letting uh, Siahan get that elbow in and move him around a little bit. He doesn't seem to mind, though, as long as he's in a good position to strike and keep scoring. Keep working on goal. Another pass here into Mount, and are we going to see a reversal again? If we are, it's coming much later than it did in the first couple of rounds. Oh, it's looking like finally he's able, after many attempts, to actually secure the Mount position. Just over a minute left in this fight. A great position on top. There's the reversal. Wow. See how it's on the top. Big knee. That was a bad knee. Time. You got it. You got it. And the referee has, I believe, judged that to be an illegal knee. I take time, right? Hey. 
Well, let's take a look at that. You can see the damage on the eye of Igor already. That's not going to help it. Can't knee him to the head. Stay there. Wow. Yeah. Looked like, looked like the butt was down. Let's see if we can take another look at that. How are you feeling? I mean, that's very close. That's very close. Like he was. It looks. It looks like the feet. The, the bottom of the feet are on the ground. The butt is not on the ground. That's that's a legal knee. That is wow. legal. Uh, yeah, if he he's only has the soles of his feet touching the ground. I don't that's, think I've ever true. seen that a knee that close to being illegal. Yes. That was legal. We're going to see if we can take another look at that now. You okay? Sure. Ask him. Yeah, it was a legal knee. It was a legal knee. Is he okay to carry on? Yeah. Oh, you got yeah, the hands off. Yeah. yeah. And the fingertips are not going to count anyway. The referees have checked the video. The uh, outside officials rather have checked the video footage there. It's a legal knee. The fight continues. Wow. I mean, thank God for uh, action replays, right? You never would have guessed that watching it in the... Uh, Absolutely not. Ball. And obviously the position of the referees in as well. He's no way of, of seeing for certain. I think Igor was a little more surprised that they stopped it, though, because he was just making sure it wasn't an early stoppage. Now he's in on the takedown again. He doesn't look too phased from it. Took that thing on the chin. Quite literally. <laughs> Renan has to dig. Yeah, now he's doing it. He has to dig, try to pull Igor up, get on his head. A more grip here. He can use this to turn off the fence, but if he stays here, Igor's eventually going to get back on his legs and get to maybe a single leg. Uh, of course, now the big takedown from Igor is setting the round. Yeah, the, the knee has to factor into the judges' scoring as well, so a legal strike. He's still going to assume that it's two rounds up. Oh, almost certainly. We will not let the judges pick that, one, pick that one out, though. Ego Voice has clearly had the opinion that he's done enough to win that one. The crowd feeling the same. There's another takedown from the Scottish Air Squad, man. You gotta feel sorry for Ronald just because he did everything right on this triple tap takedown, and then on the third one, Ego was just able to get in on his hips. Just his tenacity, his relentlessness was able to get him that uh, double leg against the fence. And, and to be honest, relentless, relentlessness is kind of the story of this whole match. It was Wojtas is just pure aggression, pure dominance, always looking, just never saying no, and always continuing to push forward with one of this. Yeah, and I was impressed with Igor here just because he took that knee on the chin and he was upset that the ref stopped the fight. He's like, no, I'm good. And he's like, wait, we just got to make sure it's legal. Well, the scorecards are in. All that remains is the throw to our man in the cage, Mr. Hal Chaplin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of mixed martial arts action, we go to our judges' scorecards. All three judges score this contest 30-27 in favor of your winner by way of unanimous decision in the right corner, Igor for the home fighter, Igor Avoitas. Commiserations to Ronald Sihan. But that was a phenomenal performance from the Polishman. Great takedowns, relentless. With the ground and pound. Eleventh victory as a professional. Very much looking forward to seeing what's next for that young man, but we're gonna keep him moving here in Glasgow. We move to the lightweight division for Deck Dean and Michael Blair. Ladies and gentlemen, your next fighter making the walk for cage in the blue corner. Please welcome Deck Dean.
taking his third walk to the Cage Warriors cage here tonight in Glasgow. Still looking for that first win in the famous yellow gloves. An 11 fight amateur career prior to turning pro back in 2022. Success early on, won his first two fights. The second fight against Anthony O'Connor ended up being uh, appealed and overturned to a no contest. We first saw on Cage Warriors, the Cage Warriors are one at 52, taking on the exciting prospect Yain Davies. Deck Dean unfortunately fallen victim to a guillotine choke in the first round of that occasion. And then next time we saw him against Chris Price. Cage Warriors 160 again, a first round submission loss for Deck Dean. So the 12 gauge MMA man refocused and looking for his first win on Cage Warriors here tonight at the expense of the hard fighter. Ladies and gentlemen, make the walk to the cage in the red corner. Please welcome Glasgow's own Michael reception from the crowd here in Scotland 26 years of age fighting out of the Scottish hit squad two and two so far as a professional second time out here on Cage Warriors we originally saw him back at Cage Warriors 163 and was stopped early by Tarek Pell just 22 seconds in didn't really have a chance to show what he was all about on that occasion so going to be looking to put that tick in the win column here tonight and what better place to do it than in front of a packed on town crowd Ladies and gentlemen, this Cage Warriors lightweight contest is brought to you by Vertex. Introducing first, Martin, out of the blue corner, he stands 5 feet 9 inches tall. Official weight, 154.9 pounds. He's fighting at the Stockport in England. And picks in the cage, a professional record. One win, two defeats, and a one no contest. Introducing Derek D. Pounds. He's fighting in his hometown of Glasgow, Scotland, up into the cage. A professional record consistent of two wins with two defeats. Adrian Jesus Leo, Michael. The opening in charge of the action begins, Mr. Rich Mitchell. Referee Rich Mitchell about to get this one underway. Three five-minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors, a lightweight division. Deck Dean with the multicolored shorts. Michael B Blair in the solid black. Okay, ready, ready. Both these guys Go. looking for that first Cage Warriors victory. Deck Dean looking to spoil the homecoming party for Michael Blair here in Glasgow. To the back. It looked like Blair thought he could get that, or uh, Dean thought he could get that guillotine, but slipped right off of his head. And you're going to be guessing that Dean does not want the fight here. His last two losses both coming by way of submission. I've seen a lot more butterfly hooks here than I usually see in San Diego. <laughs> guys are jiu jitsu -y. It's one thing I, I, I wish we see more butterfly uh, butterfly guard in MMA. We haven't really cracked a good uh, 
sort of a, a good new meta to how they use it, but I think that earlier one of, of inverting underneath and getting on the legs and using it to sweep is probably one of the best options. We need to we need more X guard in MMA. That's what you're reading. <laughs> X guard. Maybe that was what the walkout song was all about. Maybe we will see some X. X gonna give it to you. <laughs> Oh, oh, watch that posture. Yeah, throwing the legs up here for a submission and giving a, a, a really easy pass into half guard. It was almost like a trap. He like he controlled his legs perfectly, passed one to the other leg, and passed to the half guard. Super easy. Yeah, it looked like he, uh, that Blair had the opportunity if he wanted to, to go the side control and kept that leg inside of half guard for a reason. And, you know, that reason is always going to be it's a more effective position for ground and pound than, than certainly side control and potentially safer than uh, mount if the person is very dynamic and explosive at escaping underneath. Well, after watching his uh, teammate Igor go to mount, get the reversal over and over again, yep. he might be a little more inclined to stay here and just score. I mean, Dina's doing a, a pretty good job of staying on his side. The hips are turning in. Now, if he can find space on his left-hand side, he could possibly shoot his left arm underneath and use that to wrestle up, to sweep, or even to come around and take the back. So he's kind of doing everything right here, and Blair is almost overcommitting a little bit if uh, Dean can take advantage of this, which right now he's not. He's going to have to look to bring that left hand from around the head. It's not doing too much if you just control the head there. The only thing it's doing is stopping him from posturing. And, uh, and, and striking, and instead, Dean decides to try and attempt to get back to a full guard position. What well, is in a full guard position? Nice strikes here from Blair. And that's the best defense to the leg attack is to punch him in the face. Yeah, you need exactly. both their arms to really bend your leg around, and if you punch them, they gotta let go and protect their head. Don't forget, 8.30 tonight, UK time. Big main card live on international broadcast partners and UFC Fight Pass, of course. Scottish fighter in every bout on the main card. Of course, topped off by Chris Bungard, taking on Dimitri Jolene. A big clash for the lightweight division. And Folks with the Cage Warriors prize fighter tournaments coming up this year. We know one of those weight classes is going to be lightweight. So you've got to believe that Bungard and Jolene both have one eye on that $50,000 tournament. Dean getting back to his feet here, but he's got to be very, very careful. Not a huge amount of time left on the clock, coming up to just a minute. But he's got to be smart as he tries to get back to his feet here, not to expose uh, the, the hooks and have his back taken. He, was he had a good idea of doing the two-on-one, but he was kind of putting it in his lap instead of putting it on the floor. Now he rolled and... Rolls through. It looked like he was going to try and attack a, a, a leg there and then gives it up. And, and he has given, or almost given his back up. Great use of ground and pound from the turtle position by Blair to, to force a, a distraction on the upper body as he defends the strikes and opens up the legs and the hips for the back take. I think the time is on... Uh, is on Dean's side right now as there's only 20 seconds left in the round. Yeah, it just needs to be careful in these closing moments. Blair should just keep teeing off on him. Even a body shot's gonna stick with him until the next round. Dean able to scramble out, but takes a couple of elbows for his trouble. Very dominant first round for, for Blair. Let's take a look at some of the action from that first round then. Early takedown from Michael Blair. Nice ground and pound there towards the end of the round. Just having to pick those shots carefully. Well, folks, we understand that the bad guy is indeed in the house. Chris Bungard making his way into the building here at the Brayhead Arena. Huge fight coming up tonight in that main event.
We're going to get straight back to the action here at cage side, though. Michael Blair, Deg Dean, round two. Ready, ready. Set your gloves and back underway. now looking for the takedown. Has the hands connected in the body lock. Dean doing a good job of acting like the meant for that to happen. I'm surprised he wants the takedown, though. And uh, finds himself on his back, almost hits a nice reverse of the top position, but once again in turtle. He's on two on one right now. He wants to get back to his feet, but I mean, this is a terrible position to be in so early in the second round. Every time Dean lifts his hips, he gets a re he gets Blair a little off balance. If he keeps doing that and uses that two on one, he get up a little faster. Blair staying on him. He's he's doing a real good job of riding him, not letting him get too much separation before he's able to get his hands back on the floor. I mean, you're not wrong in saying it. it's interesting that Dean would look to try and take this fight to the ground because he is being out ground for. Perhaps he thinks that, that if he could just get the top position, he can really make this fight his. Yeah, he does have submission wins on his ledger from the amateur days. But it's finding that elusive dominant position that's thus far proving to be the problem for Deck Dean. Your fingers are in that glove. Keep them out. I don't want them in the cup. Watch the back of the head there, Michael. There goes Dean's two-on-one attack. <laughs> it's almost impossible to stay out of the cuff when you're grabbing and trying to pull that hand with two hands. One hook on the inside here. Dean's trying to stand. He needs to lift his butt. Uh, it looks like Blair's almost hanging off the side. If he lifts his butt and maybe attacks that head, grabs the head with his hand, and... Oh, nice. Nice little cross face to the floor by Blair. Oh, throws the legs up for a triangle. Too loose in that position and gives an underhook for the pass. We got that same pass we had in the first round. Deck Dean's corner trying to motivate that man here in this second round. Trying to neutralize Michael Blair from underneath now. Keeps grabbing that head, but probably be easier to use that hook to just push his head and try to get some space and get back on the side. Now he's stuck in a half guard position and his shoulder blades are flat on the mat. This is going to be a really hard position for him to get up from. Yeah, that was a really nice uh, hip switch pass by Michael Blair to take uh, side control. And I feel like we're going to see a far side uh, attack here. I think a head and arm or possibly a Kimura from side. Nope, there's go straight back inside of the guard there. I just feel that Blair is so dominant in this in these grappling exchanges. I think he's gonna perhaps, I mean maybe he's playing it safe here, but I feel like he could certainly up the intensity in terms of the aggressiveness of the grapple and look to start locking up submissions because we haven't seen anything really. I mean he's looked to try and take the back, but he hasn't been super aggressive in, in really setting anything up. But plenty of time still to work, another minute in this round and Almost certainly will get to the third round. Yeah. Dean looks pretty strong, though. He has, like, real cup, big, there. strong Go legs. He's probably taking a lot of energy just to subdue him, so... We'll see what he does in the third round, whether he Jones, picks it up and goes busy. for the finish Come on, let's work. Strong warning there from Mr. Rich Mitchell. He's not going to let Michael Blair just hang out. Well, it looks like Blair will likely keep this top position for the remainder of the second round. Blair can land some 
big elbows here just to finish the round strong, maybe get a cut, mess with Dean's vision. Now the question is, can Deg Dean find a answer to the puzzle here? He hasn't been able to do it so far. Taken down in the first, trying to get a takedown in the second, and found himself on his back again being dominated. What's he going to do in the third? Is he going to try and stay on his feet? Is he going to try and strike? I see those big old legs, and I'm like, leg kicks, push kicks. You just have to keep that distance. When he dropped the level, that's kind of why that knee landed on the hip so well. It looked like he was going for the takedown already. Ate a couple of knees for his trouble, but then still trying to get the takedown. Then when Blair uh, reversed it, he was able to get right back to that back position really easily. He kicked up, stayed heavy, got on top, covered the head, and circled around to the back. It was really impressive work from Blair on top. Steady stream of ground and pound from Blair while well, he had that back position. Drops a nice elbow onto the cheek of Deck Dean there. Third round underway here in Glasgow. There's a nice leg kick from Dean. And more of that. More of that will work. At least keep him at bay. Keep him from getting on top of him again. He's down two. Ooh. The timing on his knees is so impressive. Nice knee to the head from Blair. Another and a third. Dean looks a little hurt. A little uh, frustrated at least trying to get his head back up to a position where he can't get need anymore Ooh. oh big knee to the body and another to the head i don't know if he's hurt there that knee to the body brought his head right back down and now he's on the ground hook on the inside <laughs> nice ground and pound two hooks on the inside Four minutes to work here. Ugh. Oh, he's switching off of this. Interesting. Player's gonna go for What's something the weird. The there, yeah, Michael. it looks like it, doesn't it? It almost looks like he's gonna roll through to like a bear ball. Yeah, something like that. Rolling back take. I heard they were teaching that the other day. It's kind of shit spot. Hips low here, but he's very, very high. Pops oh. off and catches him with another little knee. Dean is just, just doesn't care about getting Dean in the head. He keeps shooting him for that takedown. And Blair's timing is so good. Now he's on his back again. His hips are up now. I feel like that's a much better um, strategy for getting out of this position. Hips up. I like how way back. I like how Michael Blair lifted his hands off the mat there to land that knee. Continues to try and stand. Now if, you, if you're dead then, you've got to turn the face it, but you've got to stay standing. He's on his back yet again. Attempts to sweep here. We've not seen anything from him so far that would suggest that he has the ability to do that. To Blair. Gives up the back again. More heavy ground and pound. Yeah, there's still plenty of pop on those shots here in the third round. He shot to right in front of us, and they sound hurtful. You've got to move now! Get out of there! The crowd willing Michael Blair on. And it's just the way that he's able to put all the weight into Dean's hands every time he gets his hips up. He really doesn't have anywhere to go right now. He spins through and thinks that he could have had a chance of defending the strikes from the guard position. So far, that doesn't seem to be the case. Throws the legs up for the triangle. Landed a couple of nice knees as well there, did Michael Blair. Just under two minutes left to find a finish. Oh, another nice elbow. He's using uh, Dean, controlling his arms to just roll his hand and hit that elbow right on his cheek every time. Watch your head there, Michael. The refs are so stern here. I feel like I'm in school. 
Let's get inside position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inside position. Keep his own posture there. Swing your hand on the inside. Let's go, let's get up. Oh, on, OK. Yeah, up, up, up. Dean needs to put his back on the fence right now and try to work his way back up. If he puts his back on the fence, he's going to have more success. Elbow to the fence, back on the fence, and start building that way instead of trying to stand up. Deck Dean fighting the clock almost as much as he's fighting Michael Blair at this stage. He's running out of time to find something in this fight. And it, interestingly, it's actually this turtle position that is almost the, the story of the fight. We've seen a lot of total position, a lot of attempts in the back, never really getting into a good bad position. But at the same time, uh, Dean not really able to escape this position. He spent so much time, you know, in, in attempted back return here, but that's a big ask after 50, almost 15 minutes of fighting. I like that they got in trouble for talking just now. <laughs> that's a fair point. You can't talk afterwards, right? <laughs> They're adults, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> A strong finish from Michael Blair. Very, very dominant performance. There will be no surprise on the judges' scorecards. Beautiful knee from Blair there on the replay. Oh, man. And that Dean just unable to find any answers to anything that he could get off offensively. Yeah, that knee was so well-timed, and then he was able to just land a flurry of knees against the fence. Even when Dean got his head up, he landed a big one to his body to get his head back down. And then just hanging on him against the fence, not giving him any space to move. Landed these chipping elbows from the guard. Like, that's one of those drills you do in MMA class, and you always wish you could get that to that position in a fight, and he was able to do it multiple times. Well, the scorecards are in. Here's Mr. Al Chaplin with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of mixed martial arts action, we go to our judges' scorecards. Your judges score this contest. 30-27, 30-27, and 30-26. In favor of your winner, by the way, on unanimous decision, in the right corner, Michael Blair! Big win for Michael Blair here in Glasgow. The local boy getting it done. Finally getting the show of the Cage Warriors fans, what he's all about. Dead Dean, not so fortunate on this occasion. But we are going to keep the action moving, folks. Here's Mr. Hal Chaplin to get our next contest on the way. Ladies and gentlemen, your next fighter make the walk of the cage in the blue corner. Please welcome Ned! Well, from the lightweights to the light heavyweights. Joining us from Paris, France, making his Cage Warriors debut and indeed his professional mixed martial arts debut here tonight. All six foot four, Adele Ariano. Maybe his professional debut tonight, but this is a guy who's no stranger to competition, the 29 year old. And his MMA debut back in January of 2022. We've got an incredible 13 fights in in just two years. And the majority of those coming during international competition, competed at the IMAPS many times. 
2022 took gold in the senior male heavyweight division at the IMAP European Championships. Three fights in three days. Has competed on the Cage Warriors Academy as an amateur. Competed for the Amateur Heavyweight Championship on the Cage Warriors Academy Southeast. Fortunately, that bout ended in a no contest. Now making his Cage Warriors debut proper here tonight in Glasgow. Ladies and gentlemen, making the walk to the cage in the right corner. Please welcome Jamie Jambo McDonald. Come on! First time here in Cage Warriors. 3 0 as a professional since entering the pro ranks back in March of 2022. Got a good win over Robbie Kennedy in his second pro fight. The last competed in July of last year. First round, rear naked choke on that occasion. Seven amateur bouts as well. So plenty of experience. Been competing since late 2017. You'll see in his corner, Ross Houston, the former Cage Warriors welterweight world champion. Of course, engaged in that memorable bloodbath fight against my man Nick Dalby a few years back in London. taking on the mantle of coach. Looking to calm down Jamie McDonald it seems here. Get him in that nice relaxed mindset. Have to mention as well guys, McDonald missed weight by a considerable amount yesterday. Initially tipped the scales at 209 pounds. And came back a short while later and he'd only lost 0.1 of a pound and decided to call it there. But really, it did look in the morning like he, he had no more weight to lose. Whether that will factor in or not, he's clearly a, a huge guy for the weight. Gentlemen, this Cage Warriors Light Heavyweight Contest is brought to you by Fair Tax. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, he serves 64 inch tall, official weight 204.8 pounds. He is fighting out of Paris in France and is making his professional mixed martial arts debut. Introducing Nick. Of three wins, introduces it to you, Chamber! Chamber! McDonald! You're looking in charge when the action begins, Mr. Daniel Motherheady. Mr. Daniel Motherheady about to get this one underway. Three or five minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors light heavyweight division. Right, right, I 
Mel Ariano in the black shorts. Jamie McDonald in the blue. Two big guys sizing each other up. No high advantage here, both guys 6-4. McDonald looking the physically bigger of the two, as we may have expected. Certainly Lena is Ariano. Ow. Felt that one. <laughs> I think they both felt it. It's a little toe on knee action. Nice stabbing kick to the stomach there from the Frenchman. Five wins by KO or TKO on the ledger already. I know he'd love to add to that. His first outing as a pro tonight. Yeah, it's his pro debut, but these IMMAF guys uh, have a ton of experience and good experience too. Mostly when you look at an amateur record, it's on the regional scene, but these guys go travel all around the world and fight the best in the world before they go pro. That's really valuable uh, information and really valuable uh, experience that you get before you have to put your pro in. Donald looking to secure the back here. Almost gets reversed, imagines to get into this tunnel position here and dragging his opponent back to the mat, loses position straight back on a single and Ooh. finishes off with the right hand. Wild exchange right there. Lots of back and forth and uh, Ariano ended up peeing at the very end, but at least he's out and not on the ground. Yeah, McDonald put a lot into that exchange. Ariana was able to survive it quite handily. Ariana has to be careful throwing those kicks without any setup, though, because McDonald's going to read it and throw that cross right down the pipe. Ooh. Big overhand right there from the Frenchman. Stalking Jamie McDonald here. And same goes for McDonald with a kick by itself. Ariano's smart, he can judge or try to time that and uh, go for a punch, a kick, even a takedown when he's recovering that way. Oh. Nice left hook there. McDonald looking for the takedown. Yeah, Ariano doing a great job of defending these. McDonald's going to have to do a little bit more to set these up if he wants to get this takedown. Got two minutes to go, Jamie. So go on, right? McDonald might be feeling that weight cut because there haven't really been any feints from him in this fight. You see Ariano throwing all the feints, getting the pulls, trying to get a reaction. McDonald's just going, putting all his energy into the big moves. Ross Houston in the corner telling him McDonald he wants no single shots. Frenchman looking to let rip here. Oh. Belly shot is the perfect thing to do against someone who had a bad weight cut. That stab kick to the ribs. Oh, it hurts. Like McDonald was trying to indicate that he was hit low there, but the referee said no, clean shot. Nice jab there by McDonald. Oh. Big right hand from Mariano. It's almost like McDonald's waiting for the big punch to go underneath, but he's a little slow to react, getting hit with it still, and then going underneath, and then the punches are kind of slowing down that takedown attempt. Ariana was looking for that leg trip there, didn't get it. 
And we will see a second here in Glasgow. See Ross Houston and Big Giovanni in the corner there. Jamie McDonald. fit as a butcher's dog in there. Yeah, he's trying to get back to his feet. You can see the hips turning down. He's controlling that far side arm to stop the cross face. The question is, is uh, McDonald controlling the, the far side arm? And there he goes. Now he secures the position. He's been working for this for six minutes now. First time he's finally able to get to that dominant position. And this is like a breath of fresh air for McDonald. Now he can relax, he can rest, just has to hold and control that bottom leg and keep his shoulders flat so he doesn't get out. Transitions into mount. This is massive. He's not posturing up and striking, so you've got to be guessing. He's looking the pressure. Have a good look at the upper body, see whether he's moving off to a head and arm choke. Is he trying to bring an arm across in front of the neck? Not doing much here. Bridge attempt here from Ariano underneath. That's a better reversal attempt, and he's almost off of the position, and there you go. Beautiful work by Ariano to escape there. Comes out of the back door, hits the sprawl. And now it's Ariano who's going to transition to the back now. Is he going to potentially, if he sees the opportunity, is he going to jump on the neck? Looks like he's going for that hook. His foot's in the right position to dig through. I mean, if your opponent's just defending like this, why would you stop punching him, right? Exactly. As long as he's able to pressure him, keep him stuck, and hit him, you can get the finish. McDonald needs to find a way from, out from underneath. Now Ariano trying to scramble to the cage wall. The Frenchman just letting rip here with ground and pound. McDonald going to have to defend himself a little bit better. Oh, just sit there, Jamie. You've got to improve your position. I mean, these aren't huge shots, but there's nothing coming back from McDonald. Trying to improve his position here. Yeah, he needs to go crazy just to yeah, improve and yourself, not let this fight get stopped. Because just holding your head and defending that way is telling the ref that you're done. Battles area, and I'll just keep punching, but... Maybe he feels like he needs a little more control before he lets out a few more. Just cover up. You better move your position. And it's over. Right? 
Yes. Jamie McDonald just not doing enough there. And referee Dan Moberheady has seen enough. That's a red call. Right. Now Ariano with the TKO victory in the second yeah. round. His first win as a pro. And what a time and place to do it. But McDonald was able to get to the man position he's been looking for. Here's the reverse and he just slides off high. And has the bail on the position entirely. Tries to take down again. He's unable to get it. And then it's just a barrage of strikes for a minute. Yeah. And you know he used all his energy to get that takedown. Yeah. To secure that top position. To pass the mount even. As soon as he lost it. It was a bad sign. Because he was looking like he was sucking in for the beginning of the round. Well, let's try to find man in the cage, Mr. Hal Chaplin. He will make it official. Ladies and gentlemen, your referee, Mr. Daniel Moverheady, calls a stop to this contest after three minutes and 45 seconds of round number two to claim your winner by way of TKO in the blue corner. No! Keep the action moving, folks. We've got the lightweights up next, Jordan Little and Jordan Strong. Ladies and gentlemen, your next fighter making the walk to the cage in the blue corner. Please welcome Jordan Little.
Cage Warriors Lightweight Contest is brought to you by Fairtax. Interesting first, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands at the one inch tall. Official weight, 151.1 pounds. He is fighting out of Corsa in England and is making his professional mixed martial arts debut. Introducing Jordan. Out of the right corner, he says, if he wanted to tour. Official weight, 155 points in pounds. He is fighting on a bad foot in Scotland and brings him to the cage. An unblemished professional record of two wins. And he tries to say, Mitchell. Referee Rich Mitchell about to get this one underway. Three five minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors, a lightweight division. Alright, ready. Ready. Light, 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 light. Stop. Okay, Jets, ready, ready. Let's go. Checking that cage door was locked there. Jordan Little in the blue, Jordan Strong in the black. And they are putting a rapid pace on things. You immediately see that beautiful striking of Little. Yeah, Jordan Little's kicks are lightning fast, especially that straight kick up the middle. I do the same thing that Strong's doing and shut that down immediately. Oh, it has a nice body lock right now. Little's corner, want him to turn his man off the cage, tries to throw Jordan Strong over the hip, doesn't quite manage it. It looks it, like Little is trying to roll through with it. Oh, and he gets it. Yep, Little takes top position here. He's got to watch that arm still, still on the inside. And now pretty much out of danger. Strong could attack the far side arm now, which, is look what, which looks like what he's doing. If he does want to attack this, then he's got to be looking to try and go belly down and get that left, that right foot, sorry, on the inside, which he's not doing yet. Get on the inside of that body there. There you go. Yeah, I think he heard you. Yeah. Backhand shot there as Strong got back to his feet. That's oh. left hand there by Strong. Yeah, they're happy to trade. Going to watch the educated feet of Jordan Little though. They're coming out of the Range Academy. You can expect these crazy kicks, right? And there, oh. into the takedown, beautifully done. Oh, but uh, the arms wrapped around the neck. Yeah, yeah. This, is, uh, this is a weak position to attack the guillotine from. So yeah. from uh, no issues here at all. Got to watch the back take now. This is a great position. He's still got the head, but he's given up the back. Those long legs are going to switch straight into a body triangle. Straight into a body triangle. There you go. They switch into a body triangle, and that's what happens. He turns through. A massive waste of the back position here. When you've got legs like that, there's going to be so much just residual space on the inside of that back position that if you're not securing it in a more tight position, like, like a body triangle, the person's able just to turn on the inside like that. Yeah, especially with a little waist like that, too. Exactly. Oof. These guys are so bony. Every time my elbow lands, I, I just feel horrible for the face. Lots of inside control off at the back of Little. He's got those long legs here. Might be looking to throw the legs up for a triangle. Well, he landed a few up kicks to the head in these exchanges. And John Strong's got to be uh, to be careful here. Oh my goodness! Punch off the back there. 
strong. I think it's to slow this fight I'm down right ready. here. It's so difficult to do when you've got someone who's so long and dynamic and explosive as uh, Little. And Boney, every time something flies at him, you can hear the slap. Strong in a great position here in north-south. Tying up the Kimura control, he's going to go attack the back again. Almost slips off a great, a great intelligent movement there to just slow down a little bit and re-attack the back position. Trying to sink the second hook in. Looks like he's gone for a reverse triangle. Not enough time and, and, and loses the position entirely. And little straight onto the tall position and striking from here. Looking for that big lift, doesn't quite get it there, does Little. Good defense from Jordan Strong again. Trying to peel those arms from around his waist. There's been so much back and forth in this round. I feel like either one of them can win in the last five seconds. Oh, nice elbows there from Jordan Little. Fun first round that was. Oh, that got me sweating. Yeah, I'm going to leave that one to the judges. <laughs> Wouldn't even want to hazard a guess. Mark Weir giving instructions there ahead of the second round. Chris Bungard watching on with a keen eye from cage side. Oh, nice knee trip there, and then Little was able to just attack that arm, keep it, and roll through. I think it really caught Georgia Strong off guard, but that's one of those moves that only work once in a, in a fight. Once he was able to get back up, but it was just a lot of, like, fast kicks and punches. That backhand was <laughs> a lot stronger than it seemed like it could be. Generated a lot of power from that. Kick landed right here as uh, Strong was charging in. And then the takedown was really unexpected, too, just because Little is doing so well on his feet. Ready, ready. Oh. Stiff shot there on the way in. Strong straight on the back position. Grip fighting attempts here by Little. Turns up. So tied up a Kimura here, trying to turn in. He's got a bio on it. Onto the back now, the arm straight on. Oh, this, this could be on here. Straight on now, he might try. I mean, beautiful use of the Kimura that gets a top position, though. Strike it, elbow, Let's get up, up, Yeah, that was really impressive by Little. He had to commit to that Kimura for it to work like that. He was able to do it beautifully. Now, Strong needs to be very careful here because if Little was to try and take the back with the with that right arm of Strong already under the arm there, that's going to mean that he's going to have that arm trapped. He can switch into a reverse triangle from here now. No risk of the back being taken, but the triangle is still there. Belly down arm bar. He'd want to roll through, get extension and roll. The position is lost. Staying incredibly busy is Jordan Little. Needs to get his arm free. He's going to try for that roll through again. Real back and forth uh, grappling exchange. With one hook on the inside for Strong here. If he uh, just grabs his hand, he can use the pressure to get his arm free right there. Now he can grab for the neck. Hill doing a good job of defending that second hook. Yeah. First hook is removed. Hill trying to throw him off the top here. And he brings those hips high and keeps shaking, shaking, shaking. He, he might be able to get that. Goes back to the knees now. Almost off the top. Almost an exact reverse position from where he was in just about a minute ago, but he's unable to complete it. Good job, Strong, staying on the back there because he was almost out of there a bunch of times. Yeah, and Little Lil was trying to tie up a Kimura again, but this is certainly the deepest position on the back that we've seen so far. Still great defensive work, and the hook's lost again. Real back-and-forth grappling. 
Strong needs to land some knees right here. Try to score after all that grappling. That's even better. <laughs> no, that was not good enough for the rear naked choke here just yet. He's got to move into position. He's got to get the hitch round. If you focus on getting the arm under the neck, I mean, getting the arm, arm under the neck early is fine, but you've got to immediately try and readjust the hips. If you double down on that neck, the chance of you really getting the finish is going to be so low. He was wise to the arm trap that time and didn't let uh, little slow things down by grabbing his arm and going for that roll again. I think Strong could like, even hook the ankle right here just to keep control over the back since he's guarding that second hook. Now this, for a second, more interesting, but Mill does a great job of turning back in to avoid that, that position. Beautiful elbow right in front of us here. That's more satisfying than getting that elbow once you finally secure a position to get someone so, so squirmy. Little trying to walk off the cage there and does. There you go, reverse the position again. God work being attempted here. It looks like Little's going to slip out. He's got long arms, so he's got to be careful, but the elbows are in the right position. Expect to see him try and pass right away after this. I mean, he's spending a lot of time uh, low in this position. If I'm on my feet here, I'm putting straight out. With those long arms, if he has one on the inside, then Strong just needs to get a leg on the inside of one of the arms, and the triangle's there. He's attacking this high guard, though. You know he's trying to set something up, and Little's kind of allowing him the time to attack with it. Oh, big knee from Jordan Little there. Strong needs to fight the hands, dig that elbow in, and try to circle back to the fence. All we need now is a Kimura from uh, Strong here to really yeah. <laughs> good exact replica of uh, what was happening earlier. Knee attempt by, uh, or knee there from Ooh. Little. Big knees from Little. It's a big, deep breath there from Little. And Strong then saw it as a sign that he was open, but he was able to... I'd say a good round for Strong there, but man, what a crazy back and forth cut this is. It's nuts. This fight is insane. These guys have so much energy. Here's the Kimura, and the, the, the Kimura is a great position for, I mean, the number of people who actually get this, this Kimura from the back clinch into a finish is super low, but it's excellent at escaping that back clinch position and potentially, in this instance, getting to a top position there. Very successful use of the Kimura. We saw some great dominant grappling. Not quite a mount, but as close to mount as you can be. And then Little trying to throw some uh, blows here whilst Stain's in danger just a little bit. Yeah, surprised he's not managed to cut. Jordan's strong there with those elbows. Strong clearly made a stern stuff. And we will see another round here in Glasgow. I expect both of these guys to be going Ready. for the finish Ready. because these fights were so evenly matched and so close. You don't know what the judges are thinking right now. Yeah, neither, neither of these guys could be certain which way this fight is going so far. Ooh. Big up Ian Dean, putting these great fights together for us. Little's doing good work on the feet. He needs to keep that up. That's the that front kick to the head. Oh, big shot there from Little. Tries to take down, gets it. And now it's uh, Lil who's trying to get onto the back. He's got to switch into a body triangle if he wants to take the back position. Strong's going to turn in now and secure top position here. This one needs to be using that left, the, 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 the uh, inside hook there to try and bring his opponent to the other side. There you go. That gets the second hook in. Beautifully done. He almost lost. 
the top position, the dominant position there, and that would have been really catastrophic. Trying to peel these legs away and retake the back. He's got to switch into a body triangle. He has to switch into a body triangle. The position is too loose here. Strong can turn inside of the guard right now. You're going to see if he doesn't lock this off. It's so much opportunity to switch to the body triangle, and there he does. Now this is a tighter position. Now he can start to attack the neck and not worry. The legs open again, but the arms under the neck. Lots of grip fighting here. And there's the attempt to turn into the guard, and it just looks like Jordan Strong doesn't have the energy. There's the turn into guard. That's what I'm talking about. When you have legs that long and you have someone's back, you can't just have your legs sitting there relaxed, open. There's too much space. Great stuff there from Jordan Strong. Little gave a little eye roll there, like, ah, oh, man, I can't believe I'm still fighting this guy. And now it's uh, Strong that's on the back. Both guys having their moments in this one. I think the knees are the right idea. Knees and strikes against the fence because the takedowns are taking so much energy. And then once he gets to the position, Little is able to get out. Big deep breath for Little there. Strong getting to work behind the jab. Big breath from Little. There's a shot by Strong. Easily putting his man on the map. Uh -oh, but Little has the under deep. Looked like he was going to sit up and reverse it, but now Strong's got that solid position. Both shoulder blades on the mat. Jordan Little looking very, very tired underneath guard here. Nasty elbows from underneath. Rolls over into Turtle, tries to get top position, finds himself underneath Mount. Wow, another big scramble there. And they seem to be going Jordan Strong's way ever so slightly more as this fight weighs on. I mean, it is crazy. This grappling exchange, it seems like they're just going, OK, your turn. Now my turn. Yeah. Now your turn. They've been doing it for 14 minutes. One for one drills. Yeah. But I'm not sure that Jordan Little has the energy to continue the aggressive, dynamic movements he's been making. Not long on the clock. 45 seconds. Strong's been looking for this back the entire fight. He's been unable to really secure a position. He's not going to secure one now. It's Jordan Little's go again. Going for the takedown. Kamora by Strong. What a pace this one's been fought at. Big elbow from Little. Perhaps sensing that it's a now or never moment for him. To be honest, he's pushing it through. Yeah, he's defending it. Did he tap? I mean, that is all. <laughs> wow. That went 10 more seconds. I think that might have ended in a guillotine finish. What a crazy, crazy wow. fight. Chris Bungard at cage side there, happy with Jordan Strong's work. Strong a little frustrated inside the cage, it seems, but that's a frustrating opponent in Jordan Little. You see Little landing the big right there. Yeah, this was the second time in the fight that we saw Jordan Little on the back here. He was able to lock off a body triangle. When, you, when your legs are that long, I mean, not only a body triangle, but he should have taken an inside body triangle to stop the opponent from being able to turn, and it would have just given him so much time. This open leg position, even though in this instance, Strong just really didn't, he didn't have the energy to immediately try and turn through, he eventually did so, and then turned the tide yet again.
guillotine at the end, and this was a great position. You can see how deep that wrist is. You know, so the, 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 the position in there is great. And not a great position to go high elbow, so instead, he's actually pushing through there. The hands aren't connected, but, I mean, in terms of the position of the wrist, an excellent position for the finish. Well, here's Mr. Hal Chaplin with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of mixed martial arts action, we go to our judges' scorecards. No judges score this contest. 29-28, a little. 29-28, strong. And 29-28, in favor of your winner, by way of split decision, in the blue corner, John and Jordan Little kicks off his pro career with a bang, getting the victory here in Glasgow. We are going to keep the action moving, folks. Bats and Weiss are up next. Ladies and gentlemen, your next fighter, Mick Cage, in the blue corner. Please welcome Jack. One of the best all-action fighters on the roster. Jack Eglin making another walk to the Cage Warriors cage. The man from Melksham, England. Four and two as a professional. Had a storied amateur career, was a Cage Warriors Academy amateur champion. A couple of occasions. And he's looked great in the pro ranks. Won his first two pro fights on the Cage Warriors Academy. Joined us on Cage Warriors. Cage Warriors 136 lost to Luke Riley in the second round and lost his next one to Sam Kelly by a, a modified guillotine. But he's been on fire ever since. Stops Ilya Marienka in the first, stop Rory Evans in the second, last time out, last July. Was supposed to fight in Newcastle end of last year, that one. Unfortunately fell through his opponent, unable to compete. Tonight he gets to take out all those frustrations on that dice. Ladies and gentlemen, making the walk to the cage in the red corner. Please welcome Dan! making his way to the Cage Warriors cage. Been with us a long time, but we haven't seen a whole lot of him. Just three bouts in the last couple of years. Triangle choke victory of above them Barber on his Cage Warriors debut. Cage Warriors 137. Lost by a triangle choke to Nathan Fletcher at Cage Warriors 152. And then finally gets to show up a bit of his striking game here. We know him mainly as a grappler. BJJ Purple Bell, I believe. But last time out against Alexander Sasha Pirev. Big overhand left. Finish the fight with Grand Pound. So plenty of tools in this young man's arsenal. Was supposed to fight Aiden Stephen in Newcastle last year, but. Unfortunately, a medical issue prevented that bout from happening on fight day. But very frustrating for all involved. Glad to report that Dan's back fighting fit and ready to go here in Scotland. Ladies and gentlemen, this Bantam Weight contest is proudly presented by Fairtex. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. He stands by the age of tall. 
official weight, 134.6 pounds. He's fighting at a mansion in England. That brings with him to the cage a professional record of four wins with two defeats. Introducing Jack. He stands by the sandwich at all. Our official weight, 135.5 pounds. He's fighting at an arts in now lungs and brings him to cage. A professional record of nine wins with two defeats. Introducing Dan Dowlight. Going up in charge of natural begins, Mr. Paul Crosley. Referee Paul Crosley about to get this one underway. Three five minute rounds. In the Cage Warriors bantamweight division, Jack Anglin in the white, Dan Dice in the red. You've got to believe that both these guys have got one eye on the prize fighter tournaments coming up later this year. Details of the first tournament will be revealed very soon. All right, keep a close eye on the Cage Warriors social media accounts in the coming days and weeks, folks. Dice with the intensity at the beginning of this fight. Mixing up the strikes and the takedown attempts. Yeah, nothing but kicks and takedowns. And almost Whoa. straight into Mountain there. And, oh, big ground and pound from the Dutchman. We know Eglin can take a shot, but he's got to be careful here. Dice not getting paid by the minute. Beautiful ground and pound. Great accuracy and power behind these shots. He tries to wrestle out of it and snap down. Super aggressive start from Dice. Eglin able to separate. Dice throwing. That wheel kick doesn't land though. Oh, lands with a high kick. Just toes across the teeth there. And the right hand. Yeah, luckily Eglin's hand was up, but those toes still smacked him on the side of the face. The man from the Netherlands really getting rid of any notion that he's just a crappler. I mean, if you're Dutch and involved in combat sports, you're doing a bit of kickboxing at some point. It's pretty much a given, right? There's like a gem on every corner. Big oh. firing back now. Nice read on the uppercuts up the middle, you know. Uh, Dutch is just going for those takedowns nonstop. Oh. And now the cross, it looked like he changed level, hit that cross to the chest, and it just happened to land on the face because he's changing level, Dutch is. Eglin known for his big arms, but he gets dropped there. Some of the jab. Beautiful oh, punishment from this top position here. Big round and pound as Eglin tries to force his way up. Better movement position on the scrambles and finish top position. Eglin tries to wrestle up, but he's still hurt here. Eglin still wobbling. That head kick was inches away from hitting Eglin in the back, in the back of the neck. Yeah, nice, he's looking so dropped again with the jab. Just every single one of his shots are landing clean. On the feet and on the floor. Eglin back up and gets drilled with a left hand. Dan Dow taking his time here. His hands are like homing missiles. He's finding the mark, going right over the shoulder and onto Eglin's chin. Eglin getting off a right hand of his own. And Eglin still not looking completely solid on his feet here. Oh, big body shot though, and another. Eglin's still in this fight. Caught again. Dice with the knee that time. Stumbles. 
And this must be frustrating for Dan Dyche, right? Because he's dropped him multiple times. He's hitting him with big shots. And Eglin just keeps picking himself up and coming forward. Yeah, but you can tell he's trying to get him out of there. He's really overcommitting every now and then. And that's the thing that keeps him stumbling Eglin with the missed shots. Landing that left hook to the body three times now. And there's a, not as clean that time, but a fourth time. That body shot is huge for Eglin. He's keeping him in the fight for sure. Oh. Takes a kick again, but counters. Bit of swelling around the left eye of Eglin. Oh, nice takedown. Absolute lightning fast shot there, straight in the side control. Eglin tries to wrestle up, but a beautiful half guard sweep. Went in one direction. Dice throws the weight in the opposite direction. He throws him in that direction. Damn, that's a crazy first round. Yeah, two more of those, please. <laughs> I don't know if I can take it. Well, we'll look back at some of the action now from that first round. And yeah, you just walked right onto that jab. Yeah, kind of changed angle, circled in, and hit him right through the guard. Another jab puts him on his ass. And the ground and pound, too. Very accurate, very hard shots. I mean, I think that's why these jabs are doing so much damage, because he's landing huge ground and pound right off the bat. As soon as he stands up, his fists are like a homing missile in this fight so far. But Dan, Dan Dice must be thinking, what the hell is this guy made of? He's dropped him a couple of times. He's been hitting him with stuff on the floor. And the guy's still firing back with those nasty left body shots. Managing the hit a reversal when he takes the fight to the ground. Beck Eglin's still in this fight 100%. And Eglin fired up in the cage. He's ready to go. Touch of gloves, round two underway. Read by does sees the reaction on the kick and then he fakes it to the punch. Ooh. Both guys trying head kicks early in the second round. Good work to stop that takedown from the English room. Slips and rips to the body, does Eglin. That's the nice thing about those body shots, whether he's his body is there or his head is there. You're going to be scoring. And you can see the right-hand side of Dan Dowish is just marked up from those body punches. <laughs> Left hand upstairs that time for Meglin. Yeah, he's right. back in this fight, man. His hands are starting to find a mark, and he's catching up where he was a little behind in the first seconds of the first round. I mean, that was a lot of energy does exerted yeah. in the first round too. If all those high kicks, all those takedowns, those are high energy moves. So now he's going to be relying more on his jabs and his boxing. Again, just stumbling Eglin ever so slightly. Getting straight back to it though. Teasing the body shot again. Keeping his man guessing. And Dow's marks up under his right eye now. Man, Eglin's looking fantastic in the second round. Oh, catches him with a huge uppercut. Dow just shrugs it off. He's not coming in, though. Once he starts level changing, that's when you know he's back. Another nice left from Eglin. Good work from Eglin. You can feel the confidence building now. Locks the body kick. Oh, 
Great job coming in on the inside for Eglin here. Does it so tight up against that fence. I mean, this is kind of insane, actually, from the first round where everything that Dan Dice did, everything he did worked. The, the kicks were working, the punches were working, the takedowns were working, and he's come out in this second round and so far is not able to make anything work. His nose looks to be busted as well now. Yeah. Eglin picking up the pace again. Oh. Right hand lands for Dice. Doesn't have the snap that it did in the first round. I think those body shots have really slowed yeah. us down. Now he's looking a little more human than he did in the first 30 seconds. He looked like a machine. I mean, it looks like his nose might be broken here. A lot of blood coming out of that nose. Yeah, breathing through the mouth as well. Yeah, and that's gonna slow you down as well. He's trying to hit these takedowns, and the defensive work from Eglin is fantastic. Able to go belly down, the stop, the takedown there, pops back to his feet, immediately pummels with the right hand to the inside. That's the difference between these guys and some of the pro debuters that you saw earlier. He's digging immediately. He's immediately fighting for that underhook and using the wizard to pop back up. I mean, if you look at a, a photo of Dan Dice's face compared to Eglin's face at the end of the first round, and now you're going to look at one at the end of the second round, you wouldn't believe it. Oh. Yeah, good job by the matchmaker tonight. A lot of uh, crazy back and forth yeah. matches. That's why he's the best. Oh, that jab landed nicely. Four dice. Eglin yeah. trying to psych his man out there. You love to see it. Another crazy round. This time for Jack Eglin. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, what a come from behind victory there. The third round is going to be the interesting one, but you've got to assume with the, the way that the momentum shifted. Oh. There's a big uppercut that that's walked on to. Not sure if that was what did the damage to the nose, or maybe that one. Oh, there's the shot. Ah. The left hand from Eglin. Yeah, that's the shot where you saw suddenly that streak of blood on Eglin's legs. It was a reaction shot, kind of. He got hit by that big punch and was like, oh, time to shoot. Throw the ball around, throw the ball around. Step back, step back, step back, step back. Ready, ready? ready wow, go. Jack Eglin calling out. Dan Dodge and Dan saying, yeah, let's do it. I want to see some Max Holloway pointing at the center of the cage action. Oh, I, mean, I mean, every MMA fan <laughs> in the world wants to see that in every fight now. My new favorite meme is the picture of Max pointing at the octagon floor, and then the next picture is of everyone diving out of the octagon. <laughs> I haven't seen that one yet. Eglin walking down up against the cage, clips him with the left. Eglin can feel him fading. What's the shot to the body? That one looked like it hurt. Confidence sky high for Eglin now. Got to keep. His defense is up though. Doesn't want to make a silly mistake. As we've seen, Dash, the capability to make anyone pay. Chewing up that lead leg. That's still looking really sharp. You gotta think he'll start bringing back those head kicks that he was throwing in the first round once he recharges a bit. Eglin cut on the brow, the left eye. We have seen him cut before. Maybe a bit of scar tissue then. Great work by the Dutchman to dip underneath that shot. Oh. Eglin's really 
taking a lot of real estate right now, and it's making, uh, oh, it's making Dawes a little more predictable. He's not very predictable still, but at least Evelyn knows when the big punches, the takedowns, all that's coming. He's able to react first because he has back to the outside of the cage, or to the middle of the cage. Covering up there. Oh, oh my goodness! Eddie Gordo style. This fight is absolutely bananas. Absolutely insane. Take down successful up kick. Eglin. Is Dice going to commit to closing the distance here and trying to take advantage of the grounded opponent? Really wanted it on the ground. Smart Money says that's where he has the biggest advantage. But he's been happy to mix it up on the feet with Eglin for most of this 15 minutes. Yeah, this is the first time we've seen uh, Dice really get a top dominant position and control it. And the fence is right there. Eglin needs to hustle over there, scooch, and try to start building himself back up because he's getting flattened out in the open mat. I mean, we know that this fight is, is one of these. A minute 15 here to go, and Dice could secure this with some vicious ground and pound if he wanted. I mean, I've been waiting for this shoulder pressure all night, and Dice is using it really well right here. He's going to try and pass the mount, or thinking about it at the very least. Just under a minute to let, a minute to go in this fight. Told to work there by referee Paul Crosley. Eglin finally got some space. He's up on his side. He's trying to move, but those punches are making it hard to think. Thirty seconds on the clock now. Nice shots here by Nice. Looking for a big finish. And it's all going to come down to this third and final round. One apiece going in. He's got the Dagestani handcuff on the far side. Yeah, this is the worst position to be in the last 30 seconds of a tiring fight like this. Big round and pound for the Dutchman. Nice knee to the body and a kick. Wow, what a fight. Crazy fight. Man, after watching that first round, would never have been able to guess what would happen in the second. And then after watching the second, you wouldn't guess what was going to happen in the third. Massive round of applause from the crowd here in Glasgow. Big shots from Eglin. Three, four, five punches in sequence. They got some of it. How impressive is that? To eat a four piece and then do a huge capoeira kick like that. And then secure that takedown and suck the last bit of energy out of your opponent. I mean, look, there's a bantamweight prize fighter tournament happening this year. I think either or both of these guys deserve a slot. I definitely watch a rematch of that. Scorecards being tallied here at cage side. I believe those scores are now in, so here's Mr. Hal Chaplin with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of mixed martial arts action, we go to our judges' scorecards. Our judges score this contest 29-28. Dice, 29-28, Eglin, 
and 29-27 in favor of your winner by way of split decision in the right corner. So close, both guys having their moments, ultimately came down to that third round and Dan Dice takes the victory. We're going to get straight back to the action here in Scotland though. It's time for the featherweights. This is as real as it gets and it's mind blowing. I love everything about that fight. Oh, another man oh, Adesanya! These are the moments that the fighters live for. I can't wait. Oh, oh kicked him in the face. Oh, Rose. We will all witness a piece of UFC history. Unbelievable! You see it home watch this, and you just go, holy sh**. The double tap does what he wants! Master, teach me Kung Fu. One of the most epic fights. There's nothing I do better in this life than fighting. I'm broken, baby. This team is unbroken. We have a sport with some of the best athletes in the world. Boom! One of the greatest knockouts you'll ever see! Oh! The UFC has never been stronger. It does not get any better. Oh, that is good. This is a crazy sport, ladies and gentlemen.